All right, here we go. Live stream. Because I'm in presenter mode, Aaron, I can't get at the chat. Would you mind just typing in the chat, welcome to folks, and we'll get started in a minute or two, please? Yep, absolutely. And we are live streaming. I just confirmed it's working, so I, but I will do that. Perfect. Uh, and, and the Perfect. So welcome, folks, as you're trickling in to the Indigenous Stewardship of Water Stream. We're just going to wait a, a few more minutes uh, to give folks a chance to uh, join us and then we will get going. please sure yep i could do that yeah, absolutely and we are live streaming i just confirmed it's working so I, but i will do that Well, welcome everybody. My name is Patrick Goggin. I work with Extension Lakes team out of the College of Natural Resources at UW Stevens Point. And I wanna welcome you to this Indigenous Stewardship of Water session. I'm just looking to see if Edith has been able to join us yet and I don't see her. Edith is our first speaker. And so what I'm gonna do is gonna play a video that Earth Partnership worked uh, to put together with Edith um, and we'll start off with that as part of um, Edith's message around water and as a water walker, um, sharing the story and teachings of water. And um, hopefully we will see uh, Edith join us here um, after I play this short video. So let me just change our screen here. Hang on, bear with me. Stop that share, go here. This is a video that uh, partners who are gonna speak later, Earth Partnership uh, put together with Edith during one of the Earth Partnership sessions. And so if you were with us earlier this morning, Edith welcomed us uh, beautifully with an opening prayer. Um, but as some of you might know, there was a death of an elder up in Bad River um, that has seriously been a loss for the uh, community. And um, uh, Edith, perhaps uh, it just might have been a, an emotional day for her. And I understand that. And so um, 
we were kind of ready with uh, this video. And uh, so we'll play this and we'll see if Edith is able to join us um, in a little bit, but let's start out um, hearing from this video about wild rice and up in the uh, Kagagan sloughs. Are you seeing the uh, video screen okay from your end, Aaron? Yep. Great, all right, here we go. Generally, rice is a very delicate plant, the manumen, and um, a, a little bit of anything in excess or too less will impact that, that plant. So if something comes in and crowds the root systems of it, that's going to impact the plant. If something, um, if the water level is too high, that's going to impact the plant. If certain uh, birds aren't um, available to it to clean the plant, that's going to impact the plant. When you have all of those things happening at the same time, the plant, it's, it's probably the most difficult time for that plant to actually live. And uh, how do we help, I think, how do we help that plant to live? Because that plant has sustained us, has helped us to live for so long. The water levels have to be just right. Certain birds need to be there um, in order to, that, that are light enough to, to actually st stand right on the stem of the plant and be able to eat the worms that, that crawl up the plant. Um, the, the area for its growth and its root system, because it grows from a seed, and just like any place where you go and you have to weed plants out of a, a, a garden, it's the same thing. We need people to weed those plants out of that garden of wild rice. I am fearful of how how that's going to impact the future of our people. I can't imagine my grandchildren's grandchildren not knowing what a rice plant looks like or smells like or how to harvest it. And that has happened in certain areas of the lake. It is devastating to me as an Ojibwe woman because that has been our, our culture has surrounded and built around that in the place that we live. Our connection to this place has been built around that rice. The way we think today has changed so drastically within the past couple hundred years in all cultures that we forget what where are places in this world? We forget that we are at the lowest level. We are reliant on everything around us in order for us to live. And the more we destroy everything around us, the more we are taking our own lives. It's like committing suicide. And being conscious of that uh, way of life, you know, knowing that we do need clean water to drink. That's common fact that everybody knows. Dirty water makes you sick. Do we need to say that so simply that people begin to understand that again? We are becoming reliant on purchasing our water from bottles. Where we could sit here at one time, put our hand right in this water and take a drink because the fish species that belonged here, that sturgeon, filtered this water so well that we were able to do that. Looking at the world in a different way helps us to realize that even though we're one person, you know, that one person can affect an entire place. One person can say, yeah, it's okay to take the top of that mountain over there right off so that, you know, the weather can impact everybody living beyond it. 
whereas it had never did before. It's all right to, you know, one person said it was all right. You can, you can discharge toxins into waters so that you can kill all everything in the water, including the people who drink it. One person did that. So one person does make a difference everywhere. You know, if you think you're insignificant in this world, you're not. You're muted, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see that Edith has been able to join us yet. So in keeping on with hearing from water walkers like Edith, I am going to uh, just give me a second. I am going to bring up the website for the Woman in Water Symposium that happens in Wisconsin every year. And I know that some of the water walker women have a, a video or two on there. And if you really wanna get a sense for indigenous stewardship of water, the uh, this is the website, Spirit of the Water. So let me share. And uh, for the last, I think it's five or six years, uh, folks have been coming together over near uh, Hayward, Wisconsin, as part of a Woman in Water Symposium. And uh, it's just a fantastic week-long event. I think they have plans. Uh, they tried a, some virtual activity um, in 2020 that you see here. And, um, and uh, this is the website you can come to to see their planning, probably looking forward to uh, an event either this summer and, um, and into uh, fall. But I thought I would, this is Margaret uh, Bahan. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing uh, Margaret's name incorrectly, but let's uh, hear Margaret. Grandmother Margaret Behan is one of the members of the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, made up of 13 grandmothers from around the world. They believe that their ancestral ways of prayer, education, and healing are needed today more than ever. We were honored to have Grandmother Margaret speak at our Women in Water Coming Together Symposium 2018. Here are some of her thoughts about water. I really think it's important just for me as one person to speak about water. Water is life. Water I need. Water you need. Water all people need. Those are simple words. The simplest words are the ones that are going to get the attention of people. So that's what I am doing what I know about the water and how this water is so powerful and I said that's why our um, my um, grandparents they really um, respected the water he said when we have a ceremony don't throw the water out don't sprinkle that around be very reverent with that water because it's going to doctor that person. When we're in ceremony, it doctors all the people in there that take the water in the blessed way. The water we put on their body, the water we give them a drink, the water we bathe them with, the water that we, um, we talk to it, the water, and we tell the water to go there in that, in, when they have it in their body. Go to that place where it is not, uh, it is sick or it is um, poison or bothering our patient. Take it out. We talk to the water like that. The water hears us. It listens to us. And um, just like the fire, so that they work together, the water and the fire. So um, to do uh, medicine uh, doctrine, they use these elements, earth and fire and water. So water was, is really, um, really a, 
uh, sacred plus very uh, life, uh, life, living, living uh, element that we um, we really cherish it. We really need it. It's really valuable. We, we came from this water, human beings, and uh, and we can't live without the water. We need this water in every form, every shape. And uh, for Cheyenne people, it is the first uh, offering we have in our ceremonies. And so it's really um, essential. In keeping with her calling to protect the water and Mother Earth, Grandmother Margaret was one of the many activists at the Standing Rock Indian Reservation protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. I went there. And I really saw this, and I felt how important it was that we were standing up for the water. And we, we were all together. And I said, yeah, just think, that uh, water brought a lot of people together. See how powerful it is. Yeah, and the image that it, it takes the reflection of you that is where, where the uh, I think the native really knows it, because they're visible, vis visual people. They, oh, you know, one drop of water looks like you. You know how simple is that? But it's hard to wrap your brain around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Grandmother that's, Margaret tells us what she uh, wants us to take away from her participation at our symposium, mm -hmm. and what is important to her. I want them to. Um, be very uh, knowledgeable about our condition that we live in and also self self i'm always talking about reflection i see my my own behavior my own reflection in the people you know if i'm sitting reverent and still i look around people are sitting still if i'm like all um fidgeting and, and moving and i can see on the people across from me are doing the same thing you know and and just to be self-aware that um that we're living in a um, addictive epidemic uh, condition and people are just waiting or uh, like a robot and what is next what is next whatever's coming next there is no real living no real life authentic life authentic living and more so like talking to the um, addicted youth, their purpose, how powerful they are. When I talk to women that are um, in domestic violence and addicted, and I tell them, you know, you are the world. Do you know how beautiful you are? Do you know how the world is so beautiful? Those two words I use on them. They say, oh no, I don't feel beautiful. You have to know and see it, that you are beautiful. In your eyes, you are beautiful. So therefore, your world around you is going to be beautiful. It is beautiful. So that's really the reflection of who we are. And so I give lots of talks, especially to women, you know, and I tell them this, you know, I tell them right now, you're in such a powerful place, such a magical place, such a place that you weren't in last three minutes ago. Bring that reality, because that's what I felt. I, some uh, sacred or some some real personal reality came through my being.
right now. Grandmother Margaret Behan is just one example of the quality and uniqueness of the teachers we invite to our gatherings. Other past teachers include two times vice presidential running mate and activist Winona LaDuke, Denise ceremonial leader Grandmother Pat McCabe, and renowned water walker Grandmother Josephine Mondaman. Join us for our next Women in Water Coming Together Symposium, August 4th through 8th, 2019, on the Lacoudre. I hope um, I, for one, enjoy here. I could listen all day to uh, elders like that speak and, and share stories and uh, help us reflect around water, um, literally. And indeed, water is life. And, uh, and, and our day today here as part of Wisconsin Water Week is about action. And so that self-reflection and thinking um, about self in that water action vein it is, is an important thing. And I'm just looking to see if Edith was able to join us, but I, I don't see that she was able to. So I think, um, so I just want to reiterate, if um, you really want to get a, a, go deeper into this, that the Woman in uh, Water Symposium is available via that website and encourage you to uh, Google that and, and take a look at it. I think with that, we will move on to the next part of our agenda, unless there's any questions. So let me go back to the uh, uh, event Moby platform where, and see if there's any questions out there. No, well, yeah, so the video, I uh, both videos are out there. As you saw, I just went to and, and found them. The first video was part of the Earth Partnerships um, website. And the second video was located on that Woman in Water uh, Symposium website. So both of those are, um, viewable there and um, you can uh, follow through to see them again if you should you want to. Okay, I think I am going to move us then to our next uh, team of speakers here. So let me just uh, transition to that PowerPoint. And share my screen here. I lost my mouse. Come on. What is going on? There it is. Where's the I can Sorry, I'm having trouble slides. with my mouse. I can always share the slides if you'd like me to. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. That something's locked up here on my machine. There. So now is it working? I'm on machine. If you want to try, Aaron, I'm having difficulty here. That'd be great. So you should be able to find our Native American Task Force presentation under the uh, Google Drive. Does that look right to you? Indeed, it does. Great. Okay. So, if the speakers just want to let me know next slide, I can I can click through for you while you present. That sounds great. And I'm going to forgive my. Um, am I? I am going to be welcoming us. So let's let's do this. Uh, water connects us. Water is life, as we heard. And um, what you see there is water in a few different forms. It looks like we have Ojibwa. Uh, Menominee, Ho-Chunk, and Oneida. You noticed how I went right past trying to pronounce uh, some of those words. Um, you know, one of the things we'll see as we continue through the afternoon here is how keeping language alive and um, using it as part of our, our work it is also one of the priorities here. So I'm happy to be joined here with other members and I myself am a member of the UW Native American Task Force. We are part of Extension and the Division of Extension at UW-Madison. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, if you would. So uh, we are in the Division of Extension. Some of us are in the Natural Resource Institute, which has uh, 
all sorts of themes that uh, folks in that division help support from organizational development to natural resources to agriculture. And then many, some of the folks speaking today and part of our Native American task force are also part of our youth development uh, um, institute. And so those are two of the uh, big program areas as part of the division of extension that um, we as Native American task force come together at. And the Native American task force is made up of extension educators from around the state some are local community or county educators. And um, many of the folks on the task force are educators for tribes uh, around Wisconsin. And what, what some of the things we do as a task force are support programming and cooperation uh, with tribal communities and working effectively with tribal communities with our extension colleagues and other partners. We also try to be a sounding boy for leadership and helping to work with tribal communities across the state. We also do trainings that help support uh, bringing new extension people and other partners along with how to work effectively in tribal community uh, type partnerships and uh, collaborations. Pictures here are from uh, a workshop and training we did on the Mononymy Reservation and the bottom one is from Lac de Flambeau. Um, we try to do that training about every two years and the next iteration we hope to um, jump into in late uh, summer or next fall in Lac de Flambeau, depending on how COVID goes. Next slide, please. So I have a number of extension colleagues who are joining me today. Brian Gochi is with the Lac de Flambeau Community Natural Re uh, is a community natural resource and an economic development educator. Kat Techman is an environmental outreach state specialist at the University of Wisconsin Extension, and she works as a professor in the community resource development uh, arena. Joy Shelby is joining us from uh, Bad River Nation, and she where she is a 4-H and youth development coordinator for Bad River. And Jennifer Gauthier is joining us. She is from the Menominee County and Menominee Nation UW Extension Office and works there as a community resource educator. And together we are gonna go through some of the examples as extension educators uh, that we participate in that are water focused programs and partnerships. Next slide, please. I first got involved with uh, working in tribal communities through this wonderful event, the Lac du Flambeau Nations Lakes Fest that's been going on for 20 years. And this is where I'm gonna hand it off to my friend and colleague, Brian Gochi. Bonjour. Um, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Brian Gochi. I'm the community development educator for the Lac du Flambeau tribe through UW-Madison Extension. And we've had this office and position here uh, since 1989 technically. So uh, the Lac de Flambeau Lakes Fest, as we call it, has been a uh, educational event that the extension and our tribal natural resources department has jointly uh, sort of come up with over the years. We started back in 1995. So this event's been running for Oh, at least 25 years. And last this last summer was the first time that we did not have it for obvious reasons. Um, but basically this event does uh, several things. If you can picture a educational day with a lot of displays and, and, and individuals talking about uh, uh, topic areas surrounding water and natural resources, uh, blended in with a carnival that's what lakes fest is about so it's it's an event for the community but we also have a lot of non-tribal individuals that come to this event and what's nice about that is we have the intermingling of information education and awareness and building relationships between again tribal and non-tribal entities and it focuses in on something that's very important to all of us and that's and that's water um and so when we do these events, we have uh, uh, canoe races, we have uh, games for the kids, 
Uh, we have guest speakers. And, and as I said, we, that canoe race in and of itself kind of brings a lot of people together. But again, having that event uh, allows for information to tribal membership also to show what the natural resources programs are doing in regards to the protection of water and natural resources in general. And we're very proud of this event and that's one of the reasons and the community is proud of it. And that's one of the reasons why it continues today. And if I'm not mistaken, it's probably the, was the longest running sort of lakes fair or lakes educational event statewide. Um, next slide, please. And just to kind of, uh, kind of going into uh, something Ia said in her video is that, you know, everything is connected and, and we are sort of at the lowest point of that connection that we rely on everything that, that goes on around us. And, and we're not the most important uh, uh, living being on the planet. And with that being said, one of the things that we zeroed in on the last couple of years in Lake de Flambeau was a Lake de Flambeau resiliency plan, commute, uh, uh, climate resiliency plan. And um, we just finished this off here uh, a few months back and the, the focal point of this is water, that everything that we looked at kind of zeroed in, in in around water. So the other thing that we did, knowing that everything is connected, we have even uh, some, uh, some of our uh, um, natural mitigation planning, hazard mitigation planning, if you will, built into this plan. Um, and the other thing is that we just started it but we're already going into a phase two of, uh, of this plan to zero in on some additional species uh, vulnerability assessments, which would include uh, focusing in on a Ojibwa a food pyramid, if you will. Um, in that perspective, some of the food sources that when I was a kid growing up here, it was common to use those items, but nowadays our younger families uh, might not even know about those food sources and getting them back into the use of those items. So there's a lot more to this plan um, and it could both of those events in this plan could be a, a, a presentation in and of itself but I'll leave it at that for now and maybe we'll have some Q&A later. Next slide. Uh, Poso Jennifer Gathier ne wiswan wawain and mauni wiak case piwa kinis miak tia yope. So I just introduced myself. My name is Jennifer Gathier, and I wanted to thank all of you for being here at this gathering today. Uh, I'm a community development educator with Menominee County Nation. I'm also an enrolled member of the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin. So uh, real grateful that I get to work with the with the community that I'm enrolled with. Um, I'm doing some really different work around water. Um, our community, our extension office recently received the Centers for Disease Control that's focused on high obesity prevention. And our approach to this project has been um, a policy systems and environmental approach. And we believe that focusing on all three of these areas um, can have some real lasting and meaningful impacts on health in the community. Um, so what we've been doing is looking at our health statistics. Um, if you're not aware, Menominee County is uh, unique for a lot of reasons. So not only are we the youngest county in the state, um, we not only have nearly coterminous uh, county and reservation boundaries, um, but one of the not so great statistics is that we are also the least healthiest county in the state. So each year the county health rankings comes out with these um, health factors and health outcomes and every year Menominee County is 72 out of 72. Um, and to give you an example of some of the health disparities, I'll share with you about adult obesity. Um, on the reservation, 43% of the adults on the reservation are uh, identified as obese and compared to 31% uh, for the entire state of Wisconsin. So there's some, some, some health issues there. Uh, what the community recognizes though is that these are symptoms of much bigger things like historical trauma, uh, federal policy and history. So our approach to addressing health is a lot different. Um, with our grant, we're also 
looking at local movements in the community. So I think we saw in some of the videos today about um, water walkers um, and the people's continuing um, fights to protect our water. Uh, in our community, we have um, constant mining threats from um, the um, copper mine um, north of the reservation. Um, we're always worried about threats to the Wolf River and pollution of the waters. Um, we also have a, a mining threat that um, exists in the Menominee River. Um, my grandfather was um, involved with the Crandon mine movement um, years ago, and I remember being little and I he heard him say that as long as the beast of greed lives that those there will continue to be those threats to the water. So as long as those minerals are there, people are going to want them and are going to want to mine them. Um, so the Menominee people have been really vigilant about protecting the Wolf River and water. Um, we also have water walkers in our community. So each spring we have um, a powerful group of women that um, bring awareness to the um, the reverence of water and um, the value of it in our life. Uh, we also have some really strong cultural values uh, in Menominee County Nation. Um, we're building and strengthening those connections to our indigenous and local foods. Um, we see our Menominee language and culture as uh, strong, um, um, strong components of, of our community and their um, systems to learn from. And uh, they're very complex and there's teachings in each of our um, our words and um, each of our seasons and all of the moons. And the other thing that Menominee people are known for is our sustainability. So um, we're known for our forests. Uh, we have some uh, traditional teachings about how we care for the forest. And we also have those same teachings around water. So when I was thinking about our Centers for Disease Control grant, I was thinking of all of these things and how do these things meet together and how to create policy from this. Um, we could have easily taken a Center for Disease Control policy and like, past this, but there's no reverence, there's no commitment, and there's no um, connection to it. Um, so we worked really hard to do assessments and speak with our partners, um, integrate those health, health statistics, those local movements and our cultural values. And as a result of that, we've had three of our major partners adopt local um, informed policies, and that would include Menominee County, so the entire governmental structure, um, many Conakim, which is a grassroots group, and then our local 4-H club. Um, they're holistic, um, they address health, they address the environment, and they address uh, sugary beverages, um, but I'm going to focus on some of the water-based policies that we've passed. Um, all of these organizations passed um, policies making water the beverage of choice for all of our meetings and public events. One of the things that we saw was lots of water bottles, um, plastic water bottles at our community events. Um, if you're having an event once a week and there's 50 people, that's like 50 plus water bottles. We want to get rid of that and connect to our cultural values. Um, our policies encourage the use of reusable water bottles and serving utensils in both cultural and contemporary ways. So if you look on the left, you'll see pictures of young women and they're carrying dish bags. And this is a traditional component of our culture that we're trying to revitalize. Um, they sewed their own dish bags. They have reusable utensils and bowls and cups, reducing the um, reliance on paper products and styrofoam products at community events. Uh, we also are encouraging the use of compostable or recyclable one-time use products. So one-time use products exist. Um, they're a reality and they're there. And if we're going to use them, can we use bamboo products? Can we use things that can be composted and, and put into our gardens? Um, we also have policy that supports funding for refillable water bottle water stations in all of our facilities. So instead of buying water bottle from the vending machines, we have our water bottles and we have these refillable stations and people are recycling or um, not promoting or creating any more waste through that. Um, our policies, policies are very positive um, and they connect to that cultural value of water is life and that's my water work. Annette, why, why? Oh. Next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joy Shelby, and I am the federally recognized tribal extension educator, which is housed in the uh, Positive Youth Development Institute, UW Division of Extension. I'm also a mother, an auntie, a plant woman, a teacher, and a water protector living and working on occupied Ojibwe land on the shores of Lake Superior. I just wanted to take a minute to share a little bit about my program. Um, I do direct uh, education with youth and families in Bad River, 
And some of my pri primary partnerships are uh, the Bad River Youth, uh, Bad River Food Sovereignty Program, Mushkizibi Youth Services, uh, Mushkizibi Boys and Girls Club, Bad River Head Start. Uh, really, my objectives and goals are to um, help restore traditional plant knowledge as well as connect youth with things that are happening around Bad River food sovereignty. So we have a couple of high tunnel greenhouses. We have an extensive um, harvest program where we get families and kids out onto the land and, um, and uh, teach and, and encourage young people to use their treaty rights as well as uh, educate uh, non-tribal members on treaty rights and responsibilities um, in, in our area. So um, I think, I think I'll think i share with you just my next slide. I wanted to um, just touch on the fact that all of the things that we do here um, in Bad River uh, have a reverence and, and responsibility around clean water and um, water stewardship. So one example of, of the programming would be uh, this past summer, we did uh, our third or fourth year of canoe skills and water safety in partnership with uh, Ashland County 4-H. And uh, the goal of this program is to get young people comfortable and out on the, on the water in boats um, in inland water in the, the warmth of summer um, so that we can help kids and families be prepared to uh, go out racing. My program also has uh, resources to be able to provide community equipment. So we were able to acquire a fleet of boats and um, uh, life jackets and other things that would be needed for and transportation and, and uh, create access for families and kids to be able to go out racing, not only on res, but also across uh, ceded land on inland waters. So it is uh, nothing but a, a pleasure to work um, with the Bad River community to continue to protect the waters of this area and to help young people restore their vitality and health um, on, on and near the water. Thank you for your time. Next slide. Bonjour, uh, I'm Kat Techman. I'm an environmental outreach state specialist working in the homelands of the Lake Superior Ojibwa. And I wanna thank my colleagues from the Native American Task Force for all their work and showing the variety of programming, which is my intention here too. So I just wanna share some different ways too that we connect both with educators and train the trainer and different levels of learners in different ways to integrate Ojibwe cultural or indigenous knowledge, indigenous sciences with what we might call academic ecological knowledge. Sometimes we call that Western science, which is a really terrible word. We gotta come up with a better one for that. But a number of things that I get involved in, as do my colleagues who also help me with many of these, is professional development train the trainers uh, programs for educators and college level learners. Uh, traditionally, I usually do about four to five field courses each summer, and you can see our good friend, Ms. Edith Leoso there on one of, uh, one of our Bad Kakagan field trips, uh, field uh, courses, talking about climate change and um, through Ojibwe ecological knowledge uh, uh, and how that is affecting the Bad River uh, Nation and other nations. So we have a number of these institutes. You can see them listed there. Uh, the ones that I do are in partnership with the Bad River and Red Cliff Tribal Communities and Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission as major partners. Next slide. So as you can kind of get the theme here, I'm really into experiential learning. So I also do on the water programs for youth and adults on Lake Superior estuaries and inland lakes in the Lake Superior region. Um, these are programs that integrate again, Ojibwe cultural knowledge and ecology of Lake Superior and different water bodies. And my intention here is not so much to teach, teach youth or adults uh, uh, names of plants or things like that, but to develop a passion for Nibi, the water, so that they will love it and want to protect it. And if we learn a little bit about names of plants and other things, all the better. Next slide, please. And there's the, our, our teaching and learning and learning from each other extends more than to just in person. And we've found that that's very important to get those perspectives and those tools, especially in this year. But we have a number of uh, ways that we also promote remote learning and connection with uh, native ecological experiential knowledge and language and perspectives. Two I can point to um, 
is uh, the first one is our GWAL Changing Climate Changing Culture website. URL is there. Uh, this looks at four Ojibwe traditional lifeways or cultural practices, seasonal practices, integrating uh, indigenous knowledge with academic science to understand how climate is affecting these lifeways. And the curriculum is for students and adults and takes one through understanding, first of all, the cultural perspectives, understanding the academic science of climate change and how that relates to the sustainability of the beings that support those cultural practices, and then bringing the learner to take action by doing something within their community. There's also a unit that we added on water called Hear the Water Speak. It's the blue colored rim around the center of the circle there. That particular uh, unit was added along with a teacher training in 2016, which some of you who may have been listening earlier, this is the year that we had the ginormous floods in the Lake Superior region. And during that field course, an elder said to me, uh, Kat, don't worry that we can't get to any of our field sites. The water is speaking to us, which it certainly was. The other um, website I wanted to point out to you is on the right side, and you're getting a sneak preview of this because this is just one of the initial designs. Um, my colleagues is help, are helping me, and so are Edith and a number of traditional knowledge specialists in this region, to develop um, a website that will integrate traditional ecological knowledge of the Lake Superior Ojibwa into the Apostle Islands National Lakeshores um, educational outreach on their climate vulnerability study. So this is a sneak preview. Not many people have seen this, but this website will probably be going live a little bit later this year and will feature 360 views of each of the different ecosystems uh, with a focus on indigenous knowledge and science and how that relates to climate change and how it's affecting the sustainability of beings that support cultural practices of the Ojibwe. Next slide. So we have some uh, questions out there. Which I think I'll go to now if that's okay. Um, people were looking for copies of the videos we played earlier. I put the links in the uh, Q&A for those. Um, have a question. People are curious if Wisconsin tribal nations are directly engaged in efforts to control invasive aquatic species. Um, yes. <laughs> um, in fact, in fact, uh, this is Brian. In fact, um, I will say this way back when, and I'm going to throw out a name, uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Swenson. He was a fisheries fisheries specialist out of extension through UW Superior and it was tribes and along the uh, Bad River Red Cliff and like Flambeau where he had did some out, outreach with way before the state even started talking about invasive species that started that whole process and we had some of the first signs of invasive species uh, at boat landings way before it was uh, the in thing to do. Thanks, Brian. Any other partners want to chime in there? Um, I'm familiar with uh, what well, I know from personal experience by paddling with students on the uh, Fish Creek estuary that Cliffwick and Bad River uh, both are very active in invasive species control because we had a gentleman who was doing some purple loose strife control actually stand up on a bank overlooking our kayaks kind of surprise us but it was a teachable moment for that gentleman to uh, talk to us about how the how in this case it was the Bad River Natural Resources Department was working on invasive species control for purple loose strife. Um, so I know that there's I don't have much more specific information there may be other speakers or other guests involved in the program here that could speak more to this but uh, there's active involvement in this because these these um, these beings that um, are, as Edith has, Edith Leoso has uh, shared with me, they are just fulfilling what the creator's instructions are to them. They just simply are not necessarily in the correct place for that now. And um, they they are definitely affecting the sustainability of many of the of the beings that uh, provide um, cultural, um, cultural substance and cultural activities for um, our tribes, including uh, wild rice manumen and issues of purple loose strife and also narrow leaf cattail invading those those environments and habitats. Thanks, Kat. Yeah, and uh, 
Well, you know, we hear about that imbalance. Uh, you know, that's the message invasive aquatic invasive species are giving us. Something's out of balance there, and that's part of the story that we're learning from. Uh, one other question, and we'll move on to our, our WITAC partners, and that is, uh, how do Wisconsin tribes tend to incorporate the LGBTQ community given the stronger gender roles such as women being water protectors? Um, if I can answer that, um, I don't know that I have an answer, um, but there's definitely um, a lot of discussion around that. And I think that there's some generational um, perspectives on this. Um, I'll say that there's, as we develop our language speakers and we have more people speaking the language, um, they have a different worldview of gender. So um, all of our words in our language do not have gender. Um, um, so like Pemo uh, now is like the word for walk. Um, and it's like he or she walks, it encompasses both genders. So um, I think there's a shift as more people learn the language and become connected to that. And that's a little bit what I was talking about, about um, learning systems and language and all of that, that this is evolving and changing. Um, so traditionally, I think that there was that balance there with LGBTQ. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to the, uh, my task force colleagues for uh, your presentation and uh, sharing the breadth of uh, programming um, we just talked about. Thank you very much. I think you we'll owe us lunch. Miigwech, <laughs> 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 everyone. Thank you. I think we'll transition over to our uh, Wisconsin Tribal Conservation Advisory Council partners, if we could. Um, as that PowerPoint gets pulled up, uh, I'm just going to introduce. Um, uh, the team here. Jeff uh, Mears is the executive director of the Wisconsin Tribal Conservation Advisory Council. Lacey Hill Castern is the deputy director and tribal pest survey specialist with WITTEC. Tom Melanaric is a civil engineering technician working with WITTEC, formerly uh, a longtime employee with uh, NRCS. I should say Lacey uh, had a long time position with Bad River and has done a, a bunch of wildlife work and is a long time conservationist. Jerry Thompson is the outreach and education specialist for WITCAC. Jerry also had a long distinguished career as a resource conservationist with NRCS, which these are great relationships because the tribes of Wisconsin are very deeply engaged with USDA, NRCS and other partners at the federal level. And then last, John Pruitt from WITTAC is their resource conservationist. And so I want to welcome the WITTAC team and uh, uh, thank you for being here to share the story of what WITTAC does to support tribes and conservation in Wisconsin. Take it away, please. Well, I think I'll start us out, uh, Patrick. So this is, uh, thanks Patrick for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Jeff Mears, as Patrick said. I'm a member of the Oneida Nation. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Tribal Conservation Advisory Council, WITCAC. Prior to WITCAC, I managed the Oneida Nation Environmental Health and Safety Area for more than 25 years. And as Patrick mentioned, I'm here today with Lacey, Jerry, Tom, and Jonathan. That's the entire WITCAC staff that we have. Um, I'm going to give you a brief history of WITCAC and overview of who we work with. Lacey, Jerry, Jonathan, and Tom will talk about our subcommittees and our programs. Next slide, please. So WITCAC is a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in 2001. We are an association that provides a forum for the 11 federally recognized tribal nations in Wisconsin to identify and solve natural resource issues on tribal lands. We are a council that gives a voice on conservation issues that are important to our member tribes at the state and national levels. Tribal Conservation Advisory Councils were formed in response to the 1995 Farm Bill as advisory bodies to NRCS and USDA on tribal issues. WITCAC was the first such council formed in the country. We have a strong partnership with USDA NRCS, that's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the council reviews and recommends proposals for conservation projects from tribes in Wisconsin. There is a nexus between natural resources, conservation, and agriculture and WITCAC works with member tribes on land use planning and training like produce safety and farm business planning. We provide technical assistance for practices like aquaculture and aquaponics, and we work to provide opportunities for Wisconsin tribal youth as apprentices and seasonal workers for tribal farms. 
The WCAG board is made up of representatives from each of the 11 tribes. And, and as Patrick mentioned, two of our staff are retired NRCS employees. It gives us a unique connection to tribes and our USDA NRCS partner. You'll see in the photograph on the, to the right is Jean Buffalo. She was the Red Cliff Chair and she was instrumental in the formation of WCAC. And unfortunately, Jean passed away in 2011. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, as I'm, everyone here is I'm sure aware, the 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin, Red Cliff, Bad River, Le Couture, St. Croix, Forest County, Potawatomi, Mole Lake, Ho-Chunk, Stockbridge, Muncie, Menominee, and Oneida. Pictured at the lower right side of the map is Brothertown. They're originally from New England and they moved to Wisconsin with Oneida and Stockbridge Buncey, but they are not yet federally recognized. Next slide. So this slide just gives you an idea of the, the natural resources that tribes um, have work with. And there's over 650,000 acres of tribal land in Wisconsin. Uh, you see the breakdown in some of the forests, lakes, wetlands, and streams. There's also 22,400 square miles of ceded territory in Wisconsin with treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather. Each sovereign tribal nation is unique in their culture, history, population, and land size, but they all share that desire to improve and protect the environment. I always, in my time in Oneida and working with other tribes, I'd always pass that on when tribes we work with legislation to protect the natural resources and the environment. It was not just to protect the environment, to improve it. So I always had that language in there to protect and improve. Next slide, please. So WCAC does have that strong partnership with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, we also work with other USDA partners, the agencies within um, USDA, which is a, a large federal agency, like APHIS, Farm Service Agency, Forest Service, um, Risk Management Agency, and Rural Development. And in working with NRCS, you know, the NRCS has a vision for a world of clean and abundant water, healthy soils, resilient landscapes and thriving agricultural communities through voluntary conservation. So it's a really good fit for tribal nations to work with a government agency like the USDA on a non-regulatory basis. Next slide, please. So WCAC also works with uh, non-USDA federal partners like uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, EPA, US Army Corps of Engineers and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, WCAC staff work with funding from federal partners to provide technical assistance, invasive species monitoring, outreach, and project funding to our member tribal nations. Next slide, please. These are some of the partners we work with, uh, state partners, including the DNR, DATCAP, and of course, the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and as of late, we've been working with a lot more with the University of Wisconsin and the extension, so that's been a real benefit. Um, we thank Patrick again for attending the WCAC board meetings and making those connections for us. Next slide, please. These are some of the tribally related partners that we work with. Uh, Glyphwick, uh, Lakota Ray Community College, College of Menominee Nation, and the others listed above. So we've seen an expansion of how we're working with partners and always looking for those opportunities. And some one of the upside of the pandemic is a lot more of this, this Zoom meetings that we're having. We've been able to tap into a lot more partnerships and uh, working with on and project team meetings and a lot of other opportunities we've had. So we're looking forward to that, all the partners that we've identified during this time. So that's all I had for that brief overview of WIDCAC and who we are. Uh, next up then is Lacey. Unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So I'm Lacey hill Castern, and I am the Deputy Director and Tribal Pest Survey Specialist for WIDCAC. And as Pat mentioned, I was also, um, I worked for many years for the Bad River Tribe 9, actually. And um, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of our pe tribal pest survey program, our internship program, and jump into the committees before we transition to some of the other members of our team. So I oversee the tribal pest survey program for WICAC. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, WICAC work is, works with many different partners. For this program, I work closely with tribal foresters, APIS PPQ, DADCAP, Wisconsin DNR, Forest Health, BIA, and US Forest Service. Our first survey season um, for this program was actually in 2020. And despite everything that occurred in 2020, we were still able to implement surveys with nine tribes and we collected 140 samples from 27 of the multi-funnel traps. Those would be those green traps in the picture in the right. Um, and then we also were able to deploy 71 EAB traps. So this actually exceeded our initial goal for um, implementation of these surveys. 
We were also able to um, provide internship opportunities for four, uh, four interns this summer. And in the pictures, you will see um, three of the four interns. So they did a lot of work in helping implement the surveys, checking traps. Um, they were able to gain experience in data collection. And another big part of their job this last summer was education and outreach, Well, I'll get into in an additional slide. So with the WITCAC internship program, this program actually started in 2009. And it's designed for students pursuing degrees in natural resources, biological sciences, agriculture, um, civil engineering, a variety of different types of degrees. And even like we're targeting communication majors and stuff, because those are really good majors for this education and outreach component of some of our internships. So since the beginning of this program, we have had 68 students participate in it. And they've had placements with NRCS, Forest Service, um, animal plant health inspection service, which I've been referring to as APHIS, both of veterinary services and PPQ, um, and wildlife services, risk management, and then plus we'll place interns with some of the tribal natural resources departments as well and work with projects actually occurring on tribal land. This year we're hiring 11 interns. Um, so far we have seven placed seven students are placed and I'll actually be reposting because we do have four openings yet. And um, Jerry will be going more into this internship program as well and in his part of the presentation. Um, due to the pan pandemic this last year, we actually had to get creative on how we were um, in an outreach. So this was the first year that we were really trying to do a focus on virtual education and outreach. So the interns of summer actually developed the first WCAC newsletter. And in that newsletter, here's some screenshots of it. And it's also located on our website if anybody's actually interested in reading it. But it does have um, like a recipe for garlic mustard pesto here, a way to utilize invasive species. And then we also have a scavenger hunt that was designed for families to go outside and look for signs of unhealthy trees so that they can notify their conservation departments. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk, um, start the conversation on our WCAC subcommittees. So really the idea behind these committees is to bring com conservation professionals together um, this is the list of the current committees that we have. So these current these committees are made up of tribal technical staff from each of the 11 tribes that we work with. But then we also bring in numerous other partners. Um, and usually these committees have technical trainings associated with them or different workshops. So we used to meet in person um, and these committees would have quarterly meetings or trainings. But now, um, due to the pandemic, we've been switching to a virtual platform. So the Forestry Committee, um, I've been actively involved with since it started back in 2013. Um, I showed a picture earlier on the committee slide with John Potar. He led a workshop with Bad River in 2018 on habitat typing. And that was a very well attended workshop um, from tribal organizations, the, the tribal technical staff, and plus many other agencies we had participate. In this other picture is an oak wilt workshop that the Stockbridge Muncie tribe hosted. This happened in 2019. Um, and so, and then we recently had a virtual six week EAB web series that is located on YouTube. It's publicly available. We had over 150 registrants each week for the six week web series. So that was our first attempt at doing some sort of virtual workshop um, for our committee. And then um, during the last presentation, there was a question about invasive species. Um, the tribes do have very active invasive species programs. Um, they're located in different regions throughout the state, so their primary focuses are going to vary depending on their region. Um, WICAC has actually had Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding for a couple different rounds, um, helping the tribes work on invasive species issues on tribal lands. And actually, we just received notice of, of some additional funding to help us expand those efforts. So this is just a snapshot of um, 2017 through 2019 and some of the accomplishments that occurred with four tribal nations that we work with, Bad River, um, 
Sequoia Mole Lake, Oneida Nation, and the Stockbridge Munsee Tribe for this particular project. And so with that, I'm going to transition to Jerry. Thanks, Lacey. So um, I'm Jerry Thompson, the Outreach um, and Education Specialist. Um, and I kind of oversee the, uh, um, the meetings of the Agriculture Subcommittee. <clears throat> it's a fairly new committee. Actually, we'll, we're celebrating our one year anniversary right now. And so it kind of came about with all the trainings that we've done over the years. We always kind of take a survey as to what it is that people want for trainings and, and other activities. And we're getting a lot of requests for um, agriculture type trainings, such things as, as, as how do you manage a, a, a greenhouse or, or a hoop house, um, vegetable and fruit um, production and things like that. So with all of that input, um, we approached the board and, and asked about forming an agriculture subcommittee. And uh, Chad Abel from uh, Redcliffe took the lead on that. And that's, that's how this committee came to be. There you go. So I do a, a lot of work with partners right now as far as um, training activities. And this is the latest one that um, rolling out actually tomorrow. Um, you can see all the partners down there on the bottom. This is as being led mainly by Menominee and and um, and uh, and IEC. So still time to sign up. The the first training is is tomorrow. They're only one hour long. We're going to be having a, a new backyard gardener series all um, uh, spring and summer long. And so this is the type of stuff that I, I work on a lot right now um, through the agriculture subcommittee. We also have um, more bigger requests that the committee has come up with, such as um, wanting to know how it's possible to establish um, meat plants, processing plants. So we brought that up with DATCAP uh, a few months ago, and, and that kind of prompted them thinking about well, gee, maybe we should be working with the tribes about establishing and, and, and putting meat processing facilities on tribal lands um, because there's a, there's a need for that here in Wisconsin. And we also have a, a need um, with these certified kitchens. So that's a, another initiative that we're looking at here, more on the larger scale um, on food sovereignty um, type, type of issues for the big scale. This here, here's kind of the smaller scale. So we run the gamut all the way um, in between. One of the things that I, I'm working on quite a bit right now is, is trying to get tribal students and, and, and recent graduates in with the USDA agencies. There is a big push right now to hire people. A lot of people have retired in USDA. And right now there's an open, um, you can see right there through July 15th, there's an open season right now for the states to be able to hire people directly from within their states and not have to go th through the federal process. There's over 2000 positions right now available. And if you go to our Facebook page, you, you'll see there where I have posted all of those positions that are available for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Farm Service Agency, the Risk Management Agency, and the um, Farm Production um, Organizations. And so I'm gonna show you, this is um, USA Jobs. It's a, you, you might think it's a little complicated, but once you get in there and you start playing with it, it's, it's, it's not as complicated as, as, as people think. And so this is the one of the positions that I pulled up. And the reason why I pulled up a soil conservationist position to kind of show you what this is all about is that a soil conservationist is kind of a jack of all trades. As a soil conservationist, you work in forestry issues, you work in soil issues, you work in water issues. And everything that the soil conservationist does has the whole gamut of natural resources. And so when you go into the USA jobs, you'll, you'll see this as, as the descriptions and it will talk about the pay scale, permanent positions and full time and, and we'll give the salary range. So this is a, a good place to start if you're not really sure 
what type of career you want um, with USDA or even with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the USDI, Bureau of Land Management. We've had a lot of folks who started working with NRCS as a soil conservationist, and they've moved into all those other departments and all those other agencies. So it's a kind of a, a, a good stepping stone. Go ahead, Lisa. So right now, these are the positions that are open here in Wisconsin. Um, and here, if you like any of those positions, there's a couple people you, you need to get a hold of, Chris Borden for one, and, and Ryan in, in Madison for another, and apply for these positions. These positions are open right now. And um, it, it, it helps to talk to people, because these are direct hires. You don't have to compete with everybody nationwide. So that's the big thing about this new direct hire initiative that has but just came out. And so that's why I'm kind of pushing this. This is a great opportunity for our tribal students who are about to graduate or who have just graduated to apply for some of these positions and stay close to home and not have to move to another state or somewhere throughout the country. kind of gives you a summary uh, and the responsibilities of what a soil conservationist is. And you'll notice those tabs up along the top there, was the overview, the locations, um, the duties. So take a look at, at, at all of those tabs, you just click on them and you'll you kind of learn what it's all about. And if anybody says any questions, please give me a call. Um, this is a big initiative that I'm working on right now, trying to get um, tribal folks into these positions. Because if you're going to have a good impact from a government perspective on water, on soil, on air, on climate change, what better place to do it than doing it from the inside? Working for the agencies that can make the difference. Qualifications. The type of degrees that are needed for all the positions are are listed right here. Soil conservation or related agriculture degree. They talk about the, the hours that you got to have, what type of uh, um, se semester courses you got to have, education experience. Now, just before I put this together, I went into USA Jobs. I wanted to see if there were any intern positions available. Not too long ago, I had sent out a whole bunch of information to folks about internship positions that were available. There, there were like 1,400 of them. Internship positions don't stay up very long. And you'll see there underneath the open dates there, what, four days, a week, two weeks. If you see an internship position open for two weeks, that's a long time. They go quick um, through, through these sites. And to find internship positions, you go down to the lower right down there, you see where I have the, the box checked there by students. These are the only two positions I could find in all of USDA nationwide at this point in time. But they, when they open, they open quick and they close quick. So what a person can do, you can go in to this website, you can establish yourself a profile and you can establish a notification that if an internship position opens up in Wisconsin or a specific type of job opens up, you will get an email immediately when it becomes available. And that's that's good to know. And then if you're interested in, in a position like a soil conservationist position, it's also good to have your profile and your resume already built and saved in this website. Because like I said, they don't stay open long and you're gonna to wanna to watch and see what it is they ask for so that you can modify your resume accordingly. So that's kind of my push as I'm, I'm trying to get people into the USDA agencies and into these internship positions so that they can make an impact on our resources and our tribal nations. Oh, uh, I'm next. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, Hello everyone, my name is John Pruitt. I'm the resource conservationist for WITCAC. 
And um, we talk about wetlands. Uh, next slide, please. Or, there we go. Um, so I was hired into WITCAC uh, earlier last year as part of the conservation collaboration grant. And uh, what this is, is an agreement between WITCAC and NRCS, and it provides funding for outreach and training for Wisconsin Tribal Nations Natural Resources staff uh, through WITCAC. It also funds the position uh, for Tom Melnarek, who's our conservation engineering tech, and myself as the resource conservationist. Uh, you can see on the right, this is a brief overview of the uh, objectives that we're trying to reach with through the grant. And uh, what the grant really does is provides opportunities for generating data for decision making. This is uh, the grant right now is kind of a bare bones structure and the inventories and evaluations still need to be fleshed out. And we're hoping to do that through the subcommittees. Um, there's a lot of leeway in designing these inventories, especially with remote sensing. It makes it very easy for uh, people to find and generate information um, with uh, generating data. Ah, sorry. Okay. Um, also, there's an opportunity for planning and implementing conservation projects through EQIP, which is the environmental quality. Um, improvement program through NRCS. It's a big part of Excuse me. It's a big part of the grant. I'm actually being trained through the NRCS as a conservation planner. And I will be able to assist the tribes with uh, designing plans to meet conservation needs. And I think the most important opportunity for the conservation collaboration grant is the opportunity to build capacity for tribal staff. Uh, we're working on trying to make an impact beyond the life of this grant, the time frame. Of uh, on paper, it says uh, all of our goals and objectives are supposed to be met by 2022. It'll probably be extended out beyond that due to the impact of COVID. But uh, one thing that's not listed here is um, the training opportunities that we're trying to provide through agricultural business management, uh, forestry management, wetlands, and um, aquatic organism passage training. We're hoping to be able to put on one training for each of those categories every year. Um, I'm hoping that with the COVID situation, things will improve and we'll be able to actually put some of those trainings in place. So uh, this is just a, one, an example of one of the workshops and trainings that we were able to put on in the past in 2020. Uh, Great Lakes Stream Crossing Inventory. It was a tool developed uh, largely in collaboration between the federal government, uh, the Wisconsin and Michigan government, and also Trout Unlimited. And the most recent version is managed by Chris Esther, who's a hydrologist out of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Nicolet Shaquamagan National Forest, and he was kind enough to put on a virtual presentation for us. Um, the GLSCI uh, does a good job of addressing uh, multiple aspects of road stream crossing from an ecological standpoint. You can look at whether or not that particular culvert or stream crossing is going to be a, a barrier to aquatic organisms at particular flow levels. Uh, you can also calculate whether or not it will be able to pass uh, quantities of water during a storm events, whether or not it's going to end up flooding out the roadway or in some cases completely blowing out the roadway. I know that was a big issue during the heavy rain event in 2016. And this can provide an opportunity for resource managers to decide where their vulnerabilities are and which sites to prioritize for replacing upgrading those culverts. 
Uh, we were able to get one small field uh, training out with uh, Chris Esther, myself, Tom Melnarik, and Nathan Podney from Mole Lake. Uh, can you show the next slide, please, Lacey. Yep. Oop, we have one more. All right, thank you. Um, so one of the great things about the Great Lakes Stream Crossing Inventory is that all of the information is collected digitally on a phone or a tablet. And as you collect, as you record information, it will automatically calculate, uh, analyze, and upload data. Uh, right now, all that data is being housed on a Michigan DNR website. And um, here you can see that little yellow dot is one of the locations that we were doing our field training at it's, uh, Noisy Creek in the Oneida County Forest. Uh, see on the map, it's down near the Oneida Lincoln County border. And the table you're seeing at the bottom of the screen are some of the, some of the questions and the results generated by the stream survey. Um, this particular stream culvert is, uh, it's listed as a barrier at most flows. And it's also listed as being an old pipe that's rusting and in poor condition. So because of these qualities and other qualities as well, this would be a prime candidate for replacing it, hopefully with a stream simulation so it can better pass water and also uh, be less of a barrier to aquatic organisms. Um, next slide, please. All right, and another thing that we're working on is um, making GIS tools and resources all more widely available to tribal natural resource staff. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of opportunity that you can do with remote sensing uh, for generating data. Uh, one of the big issues or hurdles is just finding and sharing the useful data sets. There's a lot of really good information out there already some of it's available at the federal level, some of it's available at the state level. It's just a matter of figuring out where the data is, how to access it, uh, how often it's, up, it's uh, updated and, and working with it. And I'd like to thank Chris Borden from NRCS for uh, taking a lot of time to work with me on sharing this information. And he also is kind enough to take a large bit of that information and download it onto some hard drives so that Tom and I can use. And we're hoping to do this in the future and possibly get a hard drive to each tribe for their own staff to use. Also with demonstrating how to use those tools and programs in GIS, there is a set of tools in ArcMap called NRCS tools that can be used to calculate a lot of a lot of data relevant to wetlands, such as delineation. And there's also a US Geological Survey tool called StreamStats, where you can pick any point on a stream and it will calculate the basin that drains into that point and give you a lot of useful information as far as land usage upstream and how well it can potentially pass stream flows in the future and how it could be affected by climate change. You can take that information and export it and use it for your, your own uses. So that's one thing we'd like to be able to demonstrate to tribal natural resource staff, hopefully with the help of um, GIS specialists from Glyphwick or possibly the uh, NRCS. And dates and times to be announced are still hashing out the details of when these trainings will be, whether they'll be virtual or in, in person. And so just, uh, Stay tuned. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Milnark, um, I'm a civil engineering tech with WITCAC. And I just wanted to show a few uh, pictures of some of the on the ground uh, conservation projects that uh, were water related um, with our partnership with, with NRCS over, over the years. As mentioned before, I had the unique opportunity to be um, an employee with NRCS and the lead designer on, on many of these projects and construction inspector. So I can speak uh, um, forever on each one. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just briefly go through what, what uh, you guys are seeing on your screen. Um, 
one of the projects is uh, access to, to water bodies. Um, this one happens to be at uh, Cloud Lake um, on Forest County Potawatomi land. And um, prior to the, um, the ramp that you see there, it was just a, a bare bank that people were backing up into the lake and, and running up. So this was very uh, useful for, for the tribe to protect the shoreline there. On the right is um, a picture of uh, tree drops at uh, Devil's Lake, um, another Forest County Potawatomi project. Uh, and it's just what the name implies, uh, putting sea debris into the water to uh, create habitat for fish and smaller um, organisms that uh, all depend on uh, having woody debris. Next slide, next slide, please. Okay. So on the left is um, the Lacton Flambeau um, hatchery facility. This was built in uh, 2015. And um, in the last 10 years, uh, WITCAC and NRCS have partnered in um, five of these facilities around, around the state of, of Wisconsin. Um, so um, it is, this was a very uh, large project and um, Again, I could speak um, volumes on, on the construction of it, and, but just in a nutshell, it was uh, uh, very well received by the Black de Flambeau um, tribe. And then on the right, um, this is uh, a picture showing um, Beaver Dam Creek. Um, Beaver Dam Creek empties into Rice Lake, which is uh, traditionally a very um, good uh, rice um, uh, bed for the, the Mole Lake Sakagan tribe. And um, a lot of people think of perch culverts uh, in terms of fish passage um, and micro and uh, organism passage. And uh, this one did that. Um, I, I like this picture because um, this is uh, approximately 24 hours after this culvert was reinstalled at a much lower elevation. And you can see how the, what was the ordinary high water mark um, is, is no longer um, anywhere near that. And then you can also see how um, upstream from the culvert, um, it's already uh, scoured itself down to uh, mineral soil um, and removed um, any of the sediment that was there before. So um, <clears throat> yeah, in this case, Beaver Dam Creek uh, restored some of the traditional flows in, into Rice Lake, which is very important for, for rice produ production. So next slide. Yeah, um, the picture on the left just shows that same project during, uh, during construction. Um, the, the old culvert was perched uh, about a foot and a half above of above the the new one that we were putting in, and so when we started uh, excavating out, we were uh, going down through uh, layers of history. Basically, there was an old corduroy road underneath um, the uh, excavation. That once we got down there, we knew we were close to where we should be with the with the new culvert. So that was a very very nice pro project for uh, Mole Lake Sakagan. And then the last picture shows. Um, fish cribs um, being put into a water body for uh, Le Couture. And um, uh, the, the person working there is Brett McConnell. He uh, did a, a study on um, the feasibility of installing these um, plastic fish cribs. And um, um, the picture shows them actually putting, putting them in, into the water. Um, <clears throat> one thing that WITCAC has also done over the years is, is um, made technical recommendations to um, NRCS. A lot, of, a lot of the tribal projects are, um, are non-traditional as compared to uh, other farmers around the state that, you know, work, work on um, their, their stuff. And so over the years, WITCAC has... Um, has made recommendations to NRCS for things that are uh, culturally significant to them. And um, those have been put into the docket to, um, to be installed. And so um, 
that uh, has been a very successful uh, way of getting um, tribal type projects put on put onto the land and waters. And I'll, I'll leave it go at that. Thank you very much. Wow, lots of stuff going on with our WITTEC partners. That's great. I think we need to bring you back to the convention next year and uh, get deeper into some of these uh, ecological restoration projects and just the great work that you do. So thank you very much for, um, for the team's uh, presentation there. I think we're going to transition to our Earth Partnership friends. Uh, as we pull that uh, PowerPoint up, let me introduce the title. They are going to speak about Indigenous Arts and Sciences, Promoting Water Stewardship Through the Whole Chunk Perspective. Our presenters are Bethany Redbird, Rachel Bingington, and Michelle Cloud. Rachel is with Extension and with Earth Partnership. Uh, as a youth, um, positive youth development uh, educator and uh, community liaison. Michelle is with Whole Chunk Nation and was a principal investigator with this uh, Indigenous Arts and Sciences program. She is with the Bear Clan and uh, is a Whole Chunk, uh, she has a, uh, her youngest daughter is a Whole Chunk veteran and um, she is a clan mother with the Whole Chunk Nation. And Bethany works with the school community relations uh, as the, as the community uh, school school community relations director with the Ho Chunks Nations uh, Education Department, so help me welcome the Earth Partnership team uh, to talk about their work. Hi, all. Thank you uh, for having us here. Um, my name is Rachel Byington, and I am going to be um, taking care of our slides. Uh, Michelle and Bethany will be jumping in here as we move along. Um, let me share my screen. Please let me know. Do you see um, a, the slide? Yes. Looking yes. good? Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to quick provide a little brief history of um, Indigenous Arts and Sciences. And I see some familiar faces here. So, And I know some of you have this history or have uh, heard about it as well. Um, and so I um, I've been with the program for quite a bit um, as a student uh, and then at, now as an employee. Um, so I may not get it all right. So if I don't, uh, please forgive me. I'm going to try to do my best. So Indigenous Arts and Sciences um, is an initiative of Earth Partnership. Earth Partnership started with um, uh, land restoration and um, primarily with providing teachers with the education and tools that they would need to be able to provide um, restoration opportunities on the school grounds for the, their students. Uh, I believe around in 10,011, I think that's actually how I met Kat Techman, was there was a Earth Partnership up in Ashland, Wisconsin. And um, I was unaware of this because I was just a participant looking to increase my um, environmental knowledge to be able to implement programming. Um, the conversation started between uh, Bad River and the Ashland Public School Earth Partnership helped um, host some community dialogues where uh, folks from the community, both communities were providing input um, to um, see how to better work together. And that's kind of where the start um, began. Oh, now let me see why. Okay, um, so here's the vision um, for communities across the world to be actively engaged in ecological restoration that connects people to the land and each other through a commitment to stewardship. We have a 10 step model that um, you can start anywhere on this model. You, uh, you don't need to start at the top or at the bottom or left or right. You can go anywhere and you can um, cross the, the circle there um, and that's the beauty of it, I think, especially in schools, because um, sometimes even the best plans don't happen like we think they're going to. Um, and we use Reverend Wall Kimmer. She's one of our advisors. Uh, and we look at the, well, it started with four hours and now has in, um, went to five, um, five hours, but looking at re reciprocal restoration, what can we do um, for the land? The land gives us so much, but what can we do back? give back. 
so Bad River is, from my understanding, where it, kind of, it started, um, those conversations uh, naturally joined in with Red Cliff since it, they're both so um, far north. Um, and quickly Ho-Chunk Nation um, became involved, Lac de Flambeau. Um, later on, Lakota Ray, particularly the Lakota Ray Ojibwe College. Um, we now have an urban indigenous arts and sciences. And I don't see, we have, um, are starting to, uh, we have begun partnership with College of Menominee Nation too. So we do need to update our slides. Um, I'm not going to go through this one too much. Um, we provide professional development for educators in a broad sense, not just classroom teachers, but community. Um, we had have, have people um, from church um, churches signing up, um, folks from all different walks, college professors. So, um, and then there's the community engagement aspect, and that's a great time for the community to get involved, especially classroom teachers when there's often a disconnect from their lens and what the students have access to and know. So the community events are a great way to help bridge that. And the whole goal with Indigenous Arts and Sciences is to bridge the um, Indigenous knowledge with the Western knowledge. And then we have youth programming. And that's what my colleague Michelle Cloud is going to speak about. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. And um, I'm going to skip over this professional development, but do know it is a part of our program. If you want to learn more about what the professional development looks like, you can um, go to our website, Google Earth Partnership, and you will get right to it. We do have our summer programs um, listed. We have the Indigenous Arts and Sciences, which this year will be the, will be intertribal because it's a virtual platform, uh, whereas typically the um, programs happen in each of those uh, communities. And then we have our Urban Indigenous Arts and Sciences. So um, feel free to reach out once you um, uh, look, take a look and if you have any questions and want to know more. Um, just some various pictures from uh, the program. Um, folks part participating and then I'm going to get to the youth programming and now Michelle will take over. Well thank you Rachel. Um, this is Michelle Cloud and I just wanted to clarify uh, who I am. I am the Ho-Chunk Nation's principal investigator for UW-Madison Earth Partnership Indigenous Arts and Sciences program and I've held that position for the past six years. In addition, I just want to clarify that um, I am the youngest daughter of a Ho-Chunk veteran. My youngest daughter is not a veteran. And I am not a clan mother. My mother is a clan mother. So it should be, I am the youngest daughter of- I apologize, a Michelle. I was going too quickly and I, I'm very sorry for that. I just don't want my me to be misrepresented. I just yep. want to clarify that. Very sorry for that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Patrick. So I just want to thank you, Rachel, for um, the introduction to Indigenous Arts and Sciences and um, with regard to how we implement um, Indigenous Arts and Sciences in the nation's, <clears throat> in the nation's communities and to focus on water. I just wanna be able to say that and to just introduce myself um, in, my, in my language. And um, I'd like to say, um, it's good to see all of you today and um, I'm happy to be here. I greet you all with real good feelings. So I just want to um, thank uh, Water Week, Wisconsin Water Week for um, inviting us to, to share um, how we view water within our Indigenous Arts and Sciences initiative in, in our communities. So um, the Ho-Chunk people view uh, water as, as sacred. Uh, it, it's living just like all the plants and the animals and the trees and everything in nature is alive and has a spirit. Um, we use water in a variety of ways, but always to uh, give it a lot of respect because it is alive. And the way that we acknowledge uh, water and um, just even before we enter water or before we use water, you know, we always say a prayer. Um, 
uh, about it. And water is an integral part of our sacred ceremonies. And um, I just want to uh, mention that. And I am going to um, put in and talk about um, water. And Bethany, I'm going to read this now. So uh, my brother had wrote something, my brother Gordon Thunder had wrote um, about how water is sacred. And this is what it, it Nita Wonkanchunkshana, if you guys want to say that on your own, Nita Wonkanchunkshana, that means that water is sacred. And this is, this is how we say it in Ho-Chunk. He kuroke hi hi wira, ma nangre, egi jago ni kuha regi, ma hoju wangre, ma hi hoju wangre, Jagu egi ni amp hangi ji honi ampra, de ni jane i hini ampi hide, eske nida wang conjunctiona. And Bethany wrote that out. Um, it means our grandmother, the earth, and every living thing that lives beneath her waters, upon her bosom, the land, and those of the air are given life through the very sacredness of water. So I just want to share that with you. Um, and to um, mention how, um, how we implement Indigenous Arts and Sciences and uh, going along with the slide here uh, with regard to youth programming. Um, again, my brother Gordon Thunder has, uh, we, we've been implementing Indigenous Arts and Sciences in the Ho-Chunk community since 2015. And at that time he had named um, the initiative Goja Hawaii. Uh, which in the Ho-Chunk language means going on continuously. And it's the closest word to sustainability because our language is very descriptive. The uh, Goja Hawaii is an intersectionality between Ho-Chunk culture and language with um, environmental science. So um, we are happy and proud to be part of the Indigenous Arts and Sciences Initiative and to bring it into um, our communities. And like Rachel had said, to bridge, um, to be a bridge between our sacred knowledge keepers, our elders and our youth. It's really important for our youth to um, have that connection and to learn from our elders who are very wise in their understanding. And if you listen to um, any one of their lessons, you'll hear about the big impact that their ancestors had on them. There's so many of our elders who say that they learned from their grandparents, from their Choka and their Gaga about um, how to take care of plants and medicinal plants and how to use them and just to take care of uh, Mother Earth. So our language is very important and our youth are so receptive to that and learning about their culture and understanding the connection between um, the importance of culture and using that and how we interact with the natural world. So we have been very fortunate to have um, a about 50 students over the years be part of Goja Hawaii and we have some returners that um, we're very proud of and honored to, to be in their company and to share what we know with them. So I appreciate everyone being here and um, my colleague Bethany Redbird has a son who has been part of Goja Hawaii for a few years now. So I'll turn it over to you, Bethany. Thank you, Michelle. Um, as Michelle mentioned, uh, my name is Bethany Redbird. I work for the Ho-Chunk Nation Education Department as the School Community Relations Director, which just means we're advocates and liaisons for our Ho-Chunk students, um, K through 12. Um, I have been a part of Goja Hawaii for uh, uh, four years now. I didn't get to be there for the first year. And like Michelle mentioned, uh, my, old, my daughter, um, uh, Carmen was a, was part of it for a year, and then my son, Hannah Gerald, has been a part of it. He's going on year three. So uh, not only on a personal level, I've been really involved, but also professional. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm going to try and talk quickly because I know we're running way behind. Um, so one of our favorite activities for Goja Hawaii is what we call the water drop journey. And without, you can't really do a slide for it, so you kind of have to picture it in your mind. So we have a bunch of dye around the room and they're made out of paper and they're uh, parts of a water drop journey. So it'll say river or lake, glacier, 
ocean animal, groundwater, and so on and so forth. And we place those around the room. What we ask our kids, and we've actually, we ask our um, adult participants to do this as well, is to shake the die, so to speak. And on there is the English word for that, as well as the Ho-Chunk word. So for instance, lake is day. Like you all know at Madison, right? Day Jope, that means four lakes and Ho-Chunk. So what we do is they go around the room and they shake the die to see where they're going next. So groundwater may end up at the ocean or it may end up in the clouds or you know so on and so forth. Um, so it's really a great way to uh, incorporate uh, like they talked about, you know, Western knowledge with Ho-Chunk knowledge, but also the language. And the language is such a key part. Not all of our students know the Ho-Chunk language. Well, some do, for sure. But I think they really enjoy learning it, especially when it's a fun activity. The best part, though, is at the end, we ask them to make up a story and like a whole paragraph story about the journey that water drop went on. So they themselves see themselves as a water drop on that journey and then talk about the scientific processes that they've gone through. So say precipitation, condensation, you know, things like that. So they get to learn the science terms. A lot of them already know them because they're high schoolers, but they get to use the language, use the English language, use the Ho-Chunk language, and then also talk about the scientific language in one story. We have had some fantastic stories come through for Goja Hawaii. I have to say, I wish I had an example up and I don't, unfortunately, I apologize. But it's been a great activity to bring us all together. And some kids are shy, but they really kind of come out of their shells when you start talking about their language and culture. Um, and so it's been a very positive impact. It also discusses how important water is to Ho-Chunk people, like Michelle mentioned. It's sacred. So we definitely want to show them how important it is. You know, during Goja Hawaii, we have a whole week of activities. And every week is a specific theme. Um, it can be sovereignty as a theme. So we talk about, you know, the Ho-Chunk Nation and as a sovereign nation and what that means. Um, it can be plant day where we do biodiversity. Um, our water day is my favorite, uh, not only because of the water drop journey, but we also collaborate with a, a bunch of other departments in the nation. We use the Environmental Health Division. We use our Cultural Resources Department, our Department of Natural Resources, and they all join us. So when we can, pre-COVID and hopefully soon, we all get together and we go out into like the creek that's in Black River Falls. Um, and we go in there and, and Randy Poma from Environmental Health shows them how they do water testing. They also are allowed to like net some fish and some macro and micro invertebrate. So they learn about that. It's a whole day of not just stomping around the creek, which of course is always fun in the summertime in July anyway, but they really enjoy it because they're also learning at the same time. And I know I, I say it every time I talk about this, but it's my absolute favorite day. The other piece is that Michelle's mom, um, who was mentioned as a, 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 um, excuse me, a clan mother, she usually comes in in the morning and talks about how important water is. And she'll bring fresh spring water from Oxbow Pond, which is close to Black River Falls. And you can drink it right out of the pond. So it's been great for them to see that you can still do that as well. Tying again their culture and history to what we're doing now as far as water monitoring things. So it's been a great experience. Um, I highly encourage students to attend. Uh, Michelle mentioned we'd have 50. Because we went all tribal last year with all four nations due to COVID and we did it virtually, it was really great. We had, I think, 15 students, if not more. And a lot of them were from the nation. And so we had a lot of fun, you know, just interacting. And they were still really involved and interactive, even through virtual, even though I'm sure they're, they were so sick of being online. And again, this year, they probably will be too. But we then offer them afternoon activities so that they can go outside with their family members or whoever they choose and do these activities together and learn. So, you know, we the other thing we do is another incentive, so to speak, is we offer them if they're in Black River Falls or Toma, which is about 20 miles away from us, we offer them the opportunity to earn half of electric credit to attend Goja Hawaii and do the, the service learning project that we request some other projects and some other events throughout the year. So not only are they getting the experience, they're also earning a half a credit, which can be very beneficial, especially this year with COVID and some of our students struggling because they had to go all virtual. So we offer them a stipend to go. We also then offer them this half a credit, but they do have to work at it. We do ask that they do a service learning project if appropriate due to COVID. Otherwise we do online presentations, 
Um, Alex Breslau from um, Redcliffe has done a fantastic job of doing animal tracking presentations online and having the kids do it. Also how to make chaga tea. So little presentations like that, but take an hour are things that they can join online for for a little bit and then end up getting half a credit over the end of the school year. So there's a lot of benefits and it's not just for you know us as the instructors because of course obviously we're having fun as well but it's really great incentive for our students to attend and i imagine that this year we'll probably have even more students attend because of that incentive um so i just wanted to give a couple of highlights of goja hawaii he um rachel talked a little bit about the um the is professional development opportunity so i won't go too far into that since we're specifically focusing on water but I just want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. And if you have any questions, our emails will be up. So please feel free to ask. Funny up, we thank you. Thank you very much for the partnership team. So it sounds like language is just as prominent a part of your Earth Partnership um, work in Ho Chunk uh, Nation as it has been in other communities across the state. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely. And people can connect to future trainings, it sounds like, by visiting the Earth Partnership uh, website? Yes, so we offer the professional development opportunities for teachers, um, and that is on there. And then we'll offer the uh, opportunity for the students. And that probably isn't necessarily a, a publicized thing, but if your students are interested or you know someone that will be, just know that if they're not in the Black River Falls or Toma area, they won't get the half a credit, but we would love to have attendance. So just look on the Earth Partnership website and you will see all the information. Otherwise, our emails will be available. Please feel free to email any of us. Yep, we'll make sure that uh, those emails are part of the archive as, uh, that's created as uh, folks continue to watch this broadcast uh, into the future and connect with uh, Earth Partnership and other speakers. So thank you very much again um, for your presentation. And we're, we're just fine. We're a little behind, but that's, uh, that's just uh, an enigma. We'll be okay. How about we come back at, uh, and take a little break here for nine minutes and we'll start again at 3.30 uh, and transition then to hear about uh, our UW Native Nations work. So we'll take a few minute break here, folks, um, to uh, grab a restroom break or uh, cup of uh, water or coffee and uh, we'll come back around 3 30. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Very good to have you. Thank
Hey, Andy and Aaron, how are you today? Doing well, how about yourself? Doing well as well. A uh, little crazy, but all's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have a PowerPoint you want to uh, lean on today? Jesse Cottaway is going to uh, run our Prezi for us. We have a Prezi. And so uh, okay. I've been talking to Aaron uh, Burkett in the chat Good. about uh, screen sharing for Jesse to run the Prezi. Hi, Jesse. I'm sorry I didn't see you uh, jump on. Uh, I should have scrolled around my participants. So <laughs> and Patrick, we'll come. Good to have you. Patrick Thank you. And Jesse are going to lead the presentation. OK, that sounds great. No need to even introduce me. <laughs> I'm just okay. here for moral support. That sounds good. Okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Jesse Conaway here, do you all hear me? Do you copy? We do, Jesse. We're going to come back around 3.30, so we're a little behind on our schedule just by about five minutes. And uh, so we'll start around 3.30, and uh, it sounds like you have a Prezi presentation that we'll bring up for us. Sure, I can bring that up. And then, uh, Patrick, good to see you, Buju. Uh, Miigwech for hosting us. Uh, do you uh, do you have a call-in info, or sorry, call-in info for this in case um, I have issues with audio that I could use my phone for audio? Just wanted to have a backup plan. Yeah, let me find those Zoom things here. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and um, if you could put that in the chat for me, that would be great, or else just email me. No, I'll Thanks, put it Patrick. in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. So Jesse, that's the Zoom link, and then I'll put the, call, the um, credential number here in a second or the ID number or whatever they call me, see what it's called. The Zoom meeting ID, I guess it is. Yes, sir. And, you know, yeah, let me know if you have a, a phone number that I could use. Uh, it looks like, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Roger that, F. Mears, good to, good to hear ya. Is the 954, so that's the ID? There, I just threw it on there, there we for go. you. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. I'll just stand by here till we're ready. There's not a way, Jesse, you can send the link to where that Prezi account is to Erin so she could pull it up. She's probably got a sounder internet connection. If you can throw the link sure, in the chat, maybe you, yeah, maybe we can pull it up. This is the kind of game we've been playing all day. It's just part of this Zoom stratosphere. Hey, Pat, this is Deb Anderson. Hi, Deb. I got to get on early. <laughs> Good to have you. Um, are, are, are you just sharing screen then or are allowing participant uh, speakers to share screen then when they come on? Yes, that's the goal. So um, if you have your PowerPoint, when we get to your piece, we'll just have you pull it up. Um, okay. If that sounds okay. Yep. Just double checking. Yep. Okay. And I, I see you're running behind, so don't worry about it. <laughs> just a little bit. Yes, we'll be okay though. All right. <laughs> Hi, Deb. This is Jesse Conaway. Good to see you. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Aaron Burkett, I just emailed you, or sorry, I just uh, direct message you in the chat with our with our Prezi link. Yep, I've got it uh, ready to go. If you want, I could share my screen and then you could just say next slide when you're ready to go to the next slide. I think, or, that's, I'll click. I think that's the way we should go. That sounds great, Aaron. Okay. Okay, that I'm cool with that. If uh, Aaron Birdberry, you cool with that? 
Yes, I was giving the thumbs up in the video. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, pulling it up now. I, it looks good on my end. So let me introduce you all. Welcome back, folks, to the Indigenous Stewardship of Water stream. Thank you for bearing with us today. Uh, Zoom is always an interesting uh, uh, predicament, but uh, uh, I thank you all for braving it with us and uh, getting through it. Next up, we have partners from UW-Madison sharing with us how to connect with the UW system for water collaborations and research around the UW Native Nations Initiative. And uh, we have three colleagues from uh, UW-Madison joining us today. Uh, Annie's going to just sit in the wings. Aaron Bird, Annie is uh, an organization development and tribal nation specialist with Extension. Aaron Birdbear is a, a tribal relations director, our first ever in that position with the Division of Extension at UW-Madison. And Jesse uh, Conaway is with us. She uh, has worked with the Earth Partnership over the years and, and uh, is currently in a faculty associate role with the Native Nations Partnership via the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at UW-Madison. Uh, one of my uh, degrees is from there and it's a great place. And so uh, this team is going to share with us um, ways of connecting with the UW system around water collaborations and research. And so help me welcome them. And it's Jesse Conaway is gonna start us off. Welcome, Jesse. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, Miigwech, uh, Patrick, and other organizers uh, for hosting us. Uh, we're so happy to be here today. Uh, Jesse Conaway here with Earth Partnership and the Nelson Institute. I am Scots Irish from the East Coast and currently work um, it, with the Native Nations in Wisconsin in uh, relationship building, environmental partnerships, and, and also educational partnerships out of UW Madison. Um, I am also a professional paddler and uh, have worked in outdoor education um, since I was in high school. So I'm very eager to talk with you today about this topic, uh, which is which is really close to my heart. Some other colleagues are along here too. Uh, so I'll give a brief intro and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Aaron Birdbear. Um, so folks, uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, we are representing the Native Nations UW initiative, uh, which is our umbrella uh, initiative that has many priorities that uh, come under that. Uh, and environment is one of those. Uh, we convened um, together with UW colleges and extension um, for this initiative. So our plan today is to give you a little background on our initiative and, and a little about the history of it. And, uh, and then we'll go into sharing uh, some of our projects, highlighting some of the projects that come out of UW in partnership uh, with the Native Nations in Wisconsin and nationwide. Uh, so welcome and uh, turning it over to you, Mr. Er Mr. Bird Bear. Next slide, please. So as a little bit of background, um, in 2015, University of Wisconsin-Madison in partnership with the 12 Native Nations of Wisconsin hosted its first ever summit, kind of thinking about long-term relationships between Native Nations and the university. We're a research one university, we're the highest capacity of research in the United States, we do instruction, we do service. And so thinking about the ways we can establish long-term relationships for mutually beneficial projects that we might come up with together. So thinking about collaboration, innovation, uh, revitalization, what are the ways we can partner and collaborate together? And so 2015 was the first time we had this formal summit where university leadership and tribal leadership sat down and started thinking about what can long-term relationships look like. And so the UW Native Nations Initiative grew out of this summit um, following that summit, a working group was established and we think thought about other ways we could uh, identify priorities and mutually kind of agreed upon areas of interest. So next slide, please. Uh, back, back, Jesse, back with you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, this, is a, this is an image of a, a floor map uh, that we created um, 
out of the Nelson Institute together with um, the Bad River Band, Lake Superior Ojibwa. And uh, we use this as a, um, a prop for our photo shoot for this first summit uh, that Erin was um, just telling you about, um, which was um, the debut of this initiative um, in essence uh, back in 2015. So this is an image of tribal leaders um, interacting with um, this watershed map uh, that, that we created. And um, as part of that first leadership summit that we hosted in 2015, I wanted to share that with you as we gear up for, um, our, for talking about water today. Uh, there's a link at the bottom here um, to um, that, um, the summit that Aaron was just introducing to you. Um, and so on the Nelson Institute website, you can see um, if you're interested in more of the history or seeing this uh, summit booklet in full, um, you can uh, check that out. Next slide, please. And so out of the UW Native Nations Initiative came a strategic plan. So after sitting down and hosting listening sessions with the Native Nations of Wisconsin and hearing their interests and concerns and priorities, uh, we thought of uh, six areas of work that we might work on together. And four of them intersect with the water in some way, shape or form. We thought about strengthening working relationships for deepening an understanding between Native Nations and UW system as a whole. We thought about collaborative relationships for mutually productive research. We thought about identifying and collaborating on uh, environmental issues. And we thought about health related issues, including the environment in some way, shape or form. So when I think of water stewardship, we think of the importance of water. Uh, we see these intersections with concerns about the natural environment around us. And they were built into the first strategic working uh, plan of, that we developed in coordination with Native Nations. And so the goal of obviously research is, is research with Native Nations. It's trying to identify collaborative ways that we can accomplish research, considering research's history is complicated with Native Nations. It's sometimes been exploitive, it's sometimes been extractive. Uh, and so we have to think about ways of effectively collaborating with Native Nations to accomplish, to accomplish research. And this is really important. Um, UW-Madison is the birthplace of the field of limnology, the study of lakes and inland waters. So, We've had 130 years of researching fresh water as an institution. So we have a pretty good understanding of accomplishing uh, limno limno limnological studies. Uh, we have the Aquatic Sciences Center. It's a multidisciplinary research and education center for protection and sustainable use of Wisconsin's water resources. And, and through the Aquatic uh, Sciences Center, there's two federally funded programs, uh, the UWC Grant Institute dedicated to the stewardship and sustainable use of Great Lakes resources, and the UW Watteson Resources Institute coordinates research which is applicable to the solution of present and emerging water resource problems. So when we think about these mutually identified areas that are important to the tribal nations of Wisconsin, and we think about the resources we have at University of Wisconsin-Madison, our goal going forward is to have further discussions, build our relationships so we can build, bring these incredible kind of freshwater studies resources we have at the university uh, and hopefully find partnerships and collaborations with the areas of interest of Native nations. And so here we had our first started thinking about long-term relationships, identifying priority areas, and then thinking about the resources, the institution, how we might kind of pair those together. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is just an example of research. So it's important to remember faculty at the universities are, are entrepreneurs. They have to go find their own funds, usually in the form of grants, whether it be federal, state, or university grants that advance their kind of research in some way. And so faculty agendas of research, uh, they might be thinking about a particular subject area. They've got to go find some funding to keep exploring that area. And then we kind of hopefully build a better understanding of the natural world around us. So we have a whole 2,200 entrepreneurs on our campus in the form of faculty uh, going out and finding resources to help them advance research. And hopefully we're in ways to get those research agendas to kind of coordinate and, and be more aware of the needs and interests and in mutually identified areas of Native nations in regards to the environment. And so here's an example of a research through the Environmental Chemistry and Technology Program and the UW-Madison College of Civil and Environmental Engineering led by an engineering professor named Matthew Ginder Vogel with a PhD student named Sarah Dance, who's Lumbee Nation. And they're looking at culturally relevant wetland research and outreach for Native nations with an objective to enhance wild rice, manuman restoration and protection 
using uh, some techniques within their own field. So we kind of think about how research is accomplished. We have individual faculty and hopefully their research agendas we can start helping coordinate and align with the needs and interests of native nations. And so this will take time for us as an institution to, to communicate to the several thousand faculty and researchers we have on campus and illuminate the kind of shared areas of concern that intersect with the priorities and needs of native nations. Next slide, please. Thank you, Aaron, and, and thanks to Aaron, our techie as well. Appreciate this tech support. Uh, Jesse Conaway, back with you here. Uh, Patrick, please clarify, we are on till 3.50, 3.50? Is that correct? We're correct, in Jesse. about five minutes behind, so uh, take the time you need. Okay, thank you. Uh, so folks, uh, we, uh, we were asked to convene some projects out of UW um, that, uh, that are partnerships with tribal nations in working in water conservation, stewardship, uh, wetlands, um, as Aaron Bird Bear just shared with us. Um, so I have some, uh, I, I uh, reached out to folks um, and so I've got some projects to share uh, from the work that I have done and then another colleague in the Nelson Institute. So I'm gonna be sharing some of these projects that are uh, recent past and then also current, current projects. And then wanna finish with um, a couple invitations for uh, projects that we're working on uh, right now. Um, and then kind of looking towards summer and fall. So I'll finish up uh, with some invitations to this group uh, to share these and be involved. So uh, when I uh, want to give um, a big shout out to um, Bad River Ojibwa, uh, who uh, kind of took me under their wing as a grad student. Um, and so this is where I got started um, in my professional life, uh, working with tribal nations in water stewardship. Um, and so uh, this in this uh, image in the upper left, uh, this is Edith Leoso in the center of this group of youth. Um, Edith Leoso is the uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, and, and Culture Keeper Medewin uh, for her community. Uh, she, uh, Edith was my, uh, was and is my colleague. And for this project, she was my research part partner and co-writer um, as we uh, did this work in Bad River which had uh, three aspects. Uh, we, we did youth education that brought together uh, water TEK together with uh, mainstream science tools and processes uh, for uh, watershed education with Bad River Youth. And so uh, this, um, this project was um, brought together um, elders and youth and also um, other family members, uh, tribal professionals working in education and natural resources, um, and, and especially the fisheries. Uh, we spent a lot of time on Kakagan Slough, um, and so inter interacted with the, the hatchery. They were some of our main hosts and educators um, there in Bad River. So um, wanted to uh, share this project with you. Um, kind of in the context of looking at uh, what Earth Partnership was talking about with intergenerational youth education um, that is uh, focused on water, uh, culture, and language. Uh, for myself as an outdoor educator, um, this was a good common ground for me to build relationships in Bad River uh, for um, kind of seeing that interface of um, how outdoor skills um, that I've been, uh, you know, educated in, in learning about and teaching about how those outdoor skills are really um, very good baseline skills um, for uh, cultural activities, um, navigating waterways, harvesting, 
Um, and so that, that was a really good interface for us with this Bad River Youth Outdoors uh, program. And uh, so next slide, please. So out of uh, Bad River Youth Outdoors, uh, we had multiple dimensions of this project. Um, this is the Bad River Water and Culture Maps project. So that slide uh, that we shared from our original summit, that watershed map, that was part of this project. Um, and so we had, we worked together um, out of Nelson Institute and with Bad River uh, to create watershed maps um, in four media um, that were leveraged for uh, community education within the Bad River Nation. Um, and then also externally to uh, neighbors, community partners, non-tribal neighbors, uh, non-tribal public, uh, and also uh, policymakers. Uh, the, I know that the, these maps were used in some conversations with county board um, in terms of regional planning. Um, and so really uh, leveraging uh, water and culture um, from the Ojibwe perspective, uh, leveraging maps as tools um, across uh, many aspects of governance, uh, stewardship, and education. Uh, this, uh, this project has a website. So if you're interested in learning more, I, I, we'd like to see similar projects with other nations in Wisconsin. We've had a couple of suggestions about doing mapping um, in uh, you know, ceded territory wide, um, looking at one for uh, the Lake Winnebago watershed. So we'd like to encourage um, discussion about these watershed maps um, with, uh, you know, with nations in, with, in Wisconsin as we uh, prepare ourselves um, and steal ourselves for, uh, for these uh, conservation, you know, education and decisions that are, that are coming up across the state. Uh, these maps are, are really, really good tools. Uh, so take note of, of this project and check out that website if you're, uh, if you're interested in learning more. Erin, uh, next slide, please. Uh, sharing, uh, I reached out to a colleague this morning. I wasn't able to talk to her on the phone, but I, I know a little bit about her work. So I wanted to share this with you as well. Um, this is Grace Boltail of the Crow tribe um, and also descendant of Mandan, Hadatsa and Arikara nations. Uh, she is uh, came on to Nelson faculty in the uh, recently, right, uh, let's see, one year before COVID season. Uh, so uh, Grace is uh, with the Nelson Institute. Uh, she's also, uh, she has a dual appointment. She's also in the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences um, in the Department of Biological Systems. And then she's also affiliated with American Indian Studies. Uh, Grace uh, brings uh, water expertise uh, to um, the Nelson Institute and to UW-Madison and to all of us. Uh, she's working with her tribe, uh, the Crow, in um, looking at watershed uh, governance, kind of at the state level and also at the multi-state level and at the federal level. So uh, her work intersects with um, traditional knowledge and uh, state and federal policy and um, also designation. So as we know um, in the Western states, um, much of the discussion about water is water quantity. So here in Wisconsin, we, uh, we're mostly talking about water quality um, out there. The conversations are a little bit different. So uh, Dr. Boltail's uh, expertise is, is contributing to those uh, conversations and she is uh, here with us now uh, I put her um, professional website here for you all. If you want to look her up, um, her contact info is there. And we're, uh, we're very fortunate and honored to have her with us. Um, and as an aside, Grace is also looking, uh, she's also working on developing uh, community and resources for graduate students who are wanting to do uh, research with with and for tribal nations. So that's another contribution um, that uh, Grace is making to our community. Uh, so thank you to, uh, to Grace Boltail 
Uh, next slide, please. So um, moving on to uh, to current projects and then and and revisiting this invitation um, to this group. Uh, this is a, a current project that we just started this winter. Um, the Intertribal Lake Winnebago Connectivity Project. Uh, this is um, currently um, the collaboration is initiate, initiated uh, by Brothertown Indian Nation and the Nelson Institute. We had our first uh, intertribal meeting in uh, late February. We had seven tribes join in. Um, and that uh, invitation came from uh, Brothertown Chairman Fowler. Uh, we're looking to uh, invite other nations in to be involved in this project. Here's what it entails. Uh, leveraging water and wetland TEK together with Western science. Um, the, some of the objectives are uh, bringing tribal voices into water governance and water decisions about Winnebago. And also um, within uh, the water and wetlands themselves, we're looking at um, bringing recommendations um, at the state and federal level for uh, wild rice habitat suitability. Uh, within the Lake Winnebago watershed. Um, as, as we know, um, the uh, wild rice uh, was historically there. Um, and over the last about the last four decades, um, it has um, that habitat has been diminished. So looking at that together with other nations um, and agencies and interest groups uh, to um, make recommendations and, and assess wild rice habitat suitability in the current uh, watershed of uh, Lake Winnebago. Um, on behalf of these project collaborators, I'm inviting uh, other nations to be involved with this and also um, agencies, interest groups, uh, fishing clubs, who um, and, and other entities, nonprofits who are working in Lake Winnebago, we uh, we're inviting collaboration, and uh, from from tribal and non-tribal partners on this. Uh, our next meeting is on uh, 420 uh, virtual. Um, it's at noon. Um, if you're interested, uh, I, my contact is um, is on our last slide. So please do contact me interested or if you have something to share um, suggestions contacts um, about uh, Lake Winnebago next slide please Aaron this is my last project slide uh, we have, um, Aaron had mentioned, uh, Aaron Birdbear had mentioned uh, the, um, the environmental strategic priority area um, that we embraced uh, for phase one of this project. Um, and within that, um, I'm speaking out of Nelson in terms of projects that I have direct experience on. Um, this, this is one of the commitments that we made to the nations. Um, in terms of collaborating around environmental uh, professional development uh, and resource protection and stewardship. Um, so we host these fall workshops uh, together with tribal natural resource departments, uh, tribal legal departments, um, and some of the intergovernmental policy folks that work with the nations have also participated in these. Um, my, my final point on this um, is kind of looking forward towards fall 2021. Uh, we, we skipped last year, but we'd like to uh, pick this up again, uh, virtual or in person. Um, and we're going, we're honing in on uh, building our research partnerships. And so uh, there is a lot of work that's going on in terms of building a research capacity um, on the UW side and in partnership with nations, uh, building capacity to do effective and respectful 
research that leverages uh, university and tribal expertise. So that's what we will be honing in on for fall 2021. If uh, so, um, I will be uh, emailing um, tribal natural resource departments about uh, participating in this. It'll be in the end of October. So that'll be another invitation um, that's coming out. Um, and then definitely welcoming participation and suggestions uh, from this group uh, for these uh, fall workshops that uh, Nelson works on together with the nations. Um, a website here on one of our projects. Um, and uh, that brings us to our final slide. Um, Aaron Burkett, next slide, please. Uh, so we'd like to uh, say thank you, Pina Gigi Wewewen, Miigwech, Yanko. And uh, this is a, the, the contact information uh, for our team. Um, I was the chair slash co-chair of Native Nations UW for phase one. And then the other three folks listed here are our co-leads uh, for phase two. So i um, really proud and honored to be part of this and want to just say uh, thank you again to the organizers uh, for bringing us in. Uh, Aaron Birdbear, any, any, any final words? Turning it over to you. No, we're just so excited to think about the future and the partnerships and the long-term relationships the universities invested in developing with Native Nations of Wisconsin. And we'll just see where the future leads us in terms of how we can understand the world and, and try to protect the natural world around us. Well, Annan. Thank you very much, you guys. Uh, Jesse, just so you know, I threw in the uh, chat as well as a direct message to you, a uh, Winnebago effort called Winnebago Waterways, which is some of our lake organization and communities that have come together to work on Lake Winnebago. It sounds like you need to hook up with what you've been up to working with um, uh, the Winnebago system. So that's just great to hear that uh, that work is going on. Annie, did you want to uh, share something? No, I just had one in. Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, it's really exciting to see UW-Madison um, strengthening these relationships, um, working around water and tribal communities and, and beyond. So, um, Great to have that uh, story as part of uh, Wisconsin Water Week. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome and thank you, Patrick. You got it. So we're gonna transition to our next um, partner and that is the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And uh, joining us from uh, that uh, entity is Dylan Jennings. Dylan resides in Odana, Wisconsin and works as the director of public information for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, known by that acronym, Glyphwick. Glyphwick provides natural resource management expertise, conservation enforcement, legal and policy analysis, and public information services in support of the exercising of treaty rights. Dylan works to manage treaty protected resources and assists in that, uh, helping the 11 member Ojibwa tribes to implement their treaty rights. He also serves as a writer, photographer, and editor for the Mazinagan newspaper, a wonderful publication that I encourage anyone to sign up for, and I'm sure you could do so by uh, uh, checking out the Glyphwick website. The, uh, as a public information officer for uh, Glyphwick, he is responsible for designing treaty right publications that get distributed all over the country. In addition, as that public information office uh, uh, head, Dylan attends and presents many tribal environmental and educational summits and workshops like the one we're doing here today. And we're very excited and fortunate to have him in us. Thank you much, Dylan, for being with us and uh, uh, welcome. Anine, can you guys hear me? We can, you sound good. All right, thanks, sound good too. It's good to hear you. It's good to see everybody. Um, a lot of recognizable faces. Aninga Kinawea, Cat. I think we just bounce around from meeting meeting together every day. <laughs> um, but uh, very uh, very humbled and honored to participate today. 
Um, and uh, forgive, we got a couple of munchkins in the background making some noise, but you know, the more that I think about it, the reason we do all this work to protect our water is for our children, right? And their, their children someday. So it's only fitting. So if you do hear some screaming, just forgive me for a little bit. They're just really excited to be outside today. Um, again, my name is Bija Keens. I come from Bad River. Um, I work for Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. I have a lot of all sorts of odds and ends experience in different areas and different realms. And um, I probably worked with most of you in some capacity or some level um, or uh, in, uh, in uh, Aaron Birdbear's case, snowboarded with you or, or hung out with you many times. So um, again, very, very excited to be in a room full of great people. And I'm uh, going to share just a little bit about um, kind of what Glyphwick's been up to, um, give you a brief historical background about, you know, what we do as an entity um, and treaty rights in general. So do I have screen sharing abilities? Yep, you should have that ability. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Awesome. So I'm actually going to share this folder right here. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. Can you guys see this okay? We can. All right, this is a, um, a publication that we just developed um, in collaboration with uh, um, DPI, Historical Society, and, um, and uh, some good people here that uh, uh, wanted to develop a resource that uh, has, uh, has kind of the chronology of um, um, some of our, our Ojibwe tribal nations in, uh, in this neck of the woods and uh, kind of highlights and delineates uh, treaty ceded territory and, and what treaty rights are all about really so that people can have a good idea as to how we get to where we are, we're at today. And so you look at this poster, uh, we start over here left side, um, you know, obviously many people have heard about our migration story, how we end up where we are today. Well, in our language, we say Anishinaabe and Akonigewin. And what that literally means is our, our traditional law, our traditional uh, way of thinking um, originally says that we have treaties with everything in creation, first and foremost. So before we begin entering into treaties with uh, the United States, even prior to entering into treaties with other tribal nations and other local communities, uh, we were already in agreements with everything in creation that helps to sustain our lives as Ojibwe as indigenous communities. And so essentially um, those, those compacts that we have are, are some of the first and, and they were codified through ceremony and through our sheer survival as indigenous communities, all right? And so that's a very important part of um, the foundation of where, where we are at as, as tribal nations and, and how, how we make decisions to protect the environment. Um, and a lot of these old stories are, are part of what, what we call um, Arizu Kewin or, um, or just our traditional history. So those stories are embedded um, in, our, in, our traditional, um, in our traditional legends that um, typically get told in the winter time, but there's a lot of stories that also get told um, throughout the year that, that relay these important relationships that we have with the deer, with the water, with uh, everything in creation, every, every component that helps us to sustain. Obviously water being a very, very important part of our survival um, from what you've probably heard all, all day and throughout the week, uh, Nibi or Nibikong is, is, our, is a word that we acknowledge water. Um, you know, in our language, we, we, um, we have a way of acknowledging animacy and water is one of those things that's very much animate and alive, even in the way that we talk about it. And so that's a very important thing that when you, when you work with our tribal nations, um, you, you'll see that, 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 uh, that deep embedded uh, relationship is already instilled in the way that we talk about things and already embedded in how, how, we, how we share and how we view the world. And so water, water has a very powerful spirit that we acknowledge and that we, we, uh, we take care of in that manner. So moving forward, um, you know, eventually we, we enter into this era of treaty signing, right? And uh, this map down here kind of shows you which areas within the ceded territory I'm talking about, right? So you got 1836 over here in what is now present day Michigan, um, 42, kind of where, where our area, our neck of the woods, 37 and 54, all right? And so when we talk about that chronology, what's important to understand is as we move forward, 
um, some of these treaties are signed prior to um, or around the same time as statehood, right? Which creates another layer of complexity as far as, um, as far as, um, you know, authority um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and how, how that relationship pans out and who, who has delegated authority to, you know, or jurisdiction. So, you know, 37, Michigan becomes a state. 48 Wisconsin becomes a state and eventually 58 Minnesota becomes a state and so you're lo basically looking at you know how how and the, the trajectory of how um, our our region and our landscape is laid out even to this day and, and it happens throughout this uh, rigorous time of treaty signing within those treaties a big component is the the use of fructory rights that that go along with that tribes seed millions of acres of land um, to the federal government in return they they ask for or they demand um, the ability to um, to survive and to perpetuate their life way through harvesting. So their right to harvest, hunt, uh, fish, and uh, access clean clean water and resources within this whole area that we know as the ceded territory now um, was a part of those treaties and the signing of those treaties. And so moving forward, that's a really important part of. Um, of how, how we interact with the, with the environment. And it also sets tribes up for um, interesting um, and very important and strong jurisdiction over, over uh, water resources and other resources as well. So moving forward, we kind of see and, and incorporated some of the uh, you know, federal, federal policy at the time, right? We, we see a lot of the assimilatory effects um, of, uh, and colonial, of colonialization on, on our tribal nations. And, uh, and it happens for a really long time, right? Where some of the states are not acknowledging these treaty rights and uh, choosing to um, you know, subjugate uh, tribal members and tribal harvesters to these, to these uh, state laws. Moving forward though, we see this uprising in, uh, within our tribal communities, building capacity, right? And beginning to push these, these cases um, through the judicial system, right? And, uh, Literally, what that does is cements tribes' abilities to um, to not only utilize their use of fruct, but to um, to help co-manage the resource in a meaningful way. And so, we'll, we'll talk about that in a in a few minutes. But moving forward, we have the some of the landmark cases. And I know you know we're, this is Wisconsin Water Week, but a lot of our tribes, in an effort to decolonize and um, and to truly view how things are in our perspective. You know, this, the, the notion of state boundaries, um, you know, is often not a, not a conversation within our, within our circles, right? We, we acknowledge the ceded territory and the areas that our communities have traditionally um, inhabited and, uh, and harvested within. Um, and we often, you often hear our leadership call um, these areas present day Wisconsin or present day Minnesota, present day Michigan, right? And it's for, for that purpose. So moving forward, some of the landmark mark cases, um, John Drew case, happens in present day, present day Michigan. You have, um, you know, the, the big Abe LeBlanc case, right? Um, and also um, eventually uh, we see the, the Gurnow, Gurnow decision in uh, present day Wisconsin, um, giving, giving or, or reaffirming the right of tribal, tribal harvesters, tribes to utilize the, the Great Lakes or Lake Superior as a, as a harvesting realm. Um, and then the kind of one of the, the, the big cases that everyone seems to recognize is the LCO case, or sometimes known as the Voight decision, which was triggered by the Tribble Brothers arrest on Chief Lake in Wisconsin, um, and the ability for that kind of opens up um, a nexus for harvesters and the, um, and the tribes to um, work with the state on co-management issues and co-management in general. Um, and so big note, you'll notice that a lot of these cases were perpetuated or, or started um, as what we call test cases, right? And perpetuated and, and started um, on the water, right? So Triple Brothers were on, on a water body. Um, the Gurnal decision was was uh, test, ca test cased in, uh, in uh, Lake Superior, obviously. Um, and then all these other ones were, 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 were part of a test case in, uh, in the water. So water, in a, in a way, Water plays a big role in um, in uh, kind of writing history and reacknowledging um, tribal treaty rights in our neck of the woods, right? Um, 
and then in Michigan, um, rather than rather than a decision like the Voight decision, you see what we have is a, the consent decree, and then eventually the Malax decision. So, you know, this is this is a very important time period that allows tribes to set up um, important regulatory structure. And so, at the same, simultaneously around this time period, you know, you're seeing these cases um, go through and being reaffirm reaffirming tribal treaty rights, um, but you're also seeing um, you're also seeing tribes building up their natural resources departments and their their legal capacity to uh, to to maintain those use of fructs, but also to maintain um, interior natural resources within their communities and strengthen their sovereignty. Um, you know, on on when it, as it pertains to water resources and other other types of resources. So Glyphwick is you know literally formulated out of out of um, out of all this this uh, amazing work uh, led by our tribal nations. Um, a big important thing that we always stress, and I know Jesse and um, Aaron and them touched on it in their last presentation, is that uh, by virtue of living near a tribe or having tribes within the state, um, you know, these communities are inherently um, protecting uh, resources to a higher, usually to a higher degree and to a higher level. And so like Bad River, I think, Mole Lake, Forest County, and there might be a few other tribal nations all have... Uh, what we call treatment as state, um, federal federal water and air quality standards, which go beyond um, state protections for for water and uh, and air air quality resources, and so that's a that's a big deal, right? If you live live near these communities, right, you're benefiting from um, you know stronger regulatory authority and um, probably better better grade water, better grade air um, as a result, right? Tribes utilizing and wielding their uh, their treaty rights. And their their sovereignty to uh, to um, kind of raise the bar for environmental health and environmental protection. Um, so this kind of like I said, this this map is available on our on our new website that we have called ogichida.org. Um, all these um, compilations of videos that we did about these um, short videos that we did about these cases are there as well. Um, so I'll stop sharing there. Um, so. Moving forward, Glyphwick continues, um, you know, some of the great, the great work that it's been doing for the last 35 years. Um, you know, as far as water is concerned, um, you know, we're we're working on a, a whole whole plethora of different things. Um, um, everything from aquatic non-native species management and mitigation. Um, in our language, we say Bakan Ingoji got on Dadug. And so that's that's a word we'd probably rather use than invasive species, right? Invasive of invasive is a very colonized uh, way and manner of um, um, explaining um, beings that were probably put there by humans in the first place, right? So we've been we've been really uh, adamant. Uh, we have a whole whole area dedicated to working on uh, mitigation and, and and efforts to address those ones. Um, also, obviously, sea to territory um, and 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 Lake Superior fish management as well. Um, you know, our biologists are are constantly working to help. You know, work with the the various states to determine population health, establish lake goals, and uh, set harvest totals. Um, the state in general, I think, um, benefits from having tribal tribal partners in this realm, um, not only to help with the the work, but also to help establish concrete numbers, right? So tribal harvesting um, in the state here is one of the most highly, highly regulated, um, probably in the country, right? Where um, just about every fish is counted. Um, and we could talk about those processes at another time, but um, you know, this, the tribes having those concrete numbers um, help that the greater equation to figuring out, you know, total health of, of water and um, aquatic resources. Um, our enforcement division does a really awesome job in maintaining um, in our enforcement capacities, you know, enforcing our codes and our regulations within our within the seated territory and helping out with a lot of um, outreach work that our, our communities are always asking us to help out with. Um, and also another thing that's probably been mentioned a lot lately is the Manuman restoration um, and monitoring work. That's a big part of uh, Glyphwick and what our tribe steer us to work towards. We have um, biologists and um, technicians that are dedicated to working on that um, and then furthermore developing um, relationship plans we're trying not to um, call them management plans anymore because it's really uh, we see it vice versa really really what we're trying to do is manage people right 
we don't manage the resources. In, in fact, they take care of us. So we're developing relationship plans that maintain, um, you know, our knowledge bases as the foundation with uh, Western science integrated within within them. Um, and then trying to address things like climate change um, through uh, a couple of recent publications, our climate change team developed a vulnerability index. They're working on version two, which I'll have and discuss um, how vulnerable certain um, certain species and um, beings are to climate change and um, and kind of that that adapt the ability to adapt or not. Uh, and those are those are really heavily concentrated on um, a lot of aquatic resources as well. And then um, our internship programs and youth outreach has been a very big area that our our communities have tasked us with doing. Um, so everything from developing projects that uh, you know perpetuate accurate historical and cultural information that talk about treaty rights, the significance, the history, the importance, um, and uh, and integrating all that into to the mainstream work that that we do to to help protect the environment, to help protect the water resources that we all depend upon. So, um, you know, those are those are just a, um, a few a few things that I can think off the top of my head in addition to the history of treaty rights and how we got there that uh, will hopefully help people in, the, in aiding them in understanding, um, you know, how, how our communities um, are able to, uh, you know, take care, take care of their way of life, but also take care of, um, you know, very important resources that every, everybody in the state, I think, values. So, me omenik man we we tuyan me gwich bizen I think, I don't know if I'm at, at time or how long I was supposed to go for, but um, if I'm under time, if anyone has any thoughts or questions, I'm here for a few more minutes. Thank you much, Dylan. We're just fine on time, no worries there. Um, I would share Dylan and, and everyone listening, I put links to both where your poster can be found under your publications portion of your website. Um, it sounds like you've built a new website, maybe it'll redirect there. Um, and then I also put in the um, uh, Q&A section, a link Dylan to your newsletter um, in case folks wanna learn more about Glyphic. I think that's a great way to do so. Yeah, I, I just- I, I put the ogitsuda.org website in the- There it the, is, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I really appreciate everyone tuning in and uh, anyone that watches this, um, you know, really, really good to hear and see everybody and hope everybody's uh, you know, participating in some of these uh, good springtime or Ziguan festivities, right? The sap's running um, up by us. And so I hope people are are getting a little bit of that rejuvenation and renewal. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dale. And yeah, it's like spring up here in the Northwoods. We're digging it. Um, thank you very much. And it's great to have uh, Glyphic along. And I encourage folks to uh, to those links out and to visit the websites because there's just a plethora of information and uh, great resources to help us all um, learn more. Next up, we're going to transition to our partners uh, at the LCO College. And so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Deb and her title of her talk, Pathways for New Water Professionals in Higher Education, Opportunities Available um, at the LCO College. So the uh, La Couture Ojibwe College is in near Haywood, Wisconsin. Deb's been working there for the last 31 years. She's been a division chair over the years, as well as an academic dean. She teaches courses in the life sciences and water resources areas. She has uh, a BA in biology, an MS in biology with an emphasis uh, in education as a minor. And she did her PhD uh, research on water resources science. Her dissertation was with the uh, La Couture tribe. And so I think that's where that relationship began, working with the uh, LCO Conservation Department, uh, our cranberry marsh there, and looking at cranberry marsh nutrient and pesticide effects uh, being received by lake and groundwater. She has a passion for educating others uh, around water resources and the maintenance of their quality. She has served as a uh, project director on over $500,000 uh, worth of grants and worked on teams uh, that have brought in over $3 million of funded projects in her, her time. Numerous uh, roles in advisory and committee work. 
She also uh, runs a uh, family farm operation with her husband, as well as an irrigation company, which I think is pretty cool. Um, many of the folks involved today are wearing all these different hats and they celebrate sustainable practices when possible uh, on that operation, utilizing compost and manure for fertilizer, rotating their pastures, uh, using an outdoor wood stove for their heating source, using solar panels for electricity and a greenhouse to extend the growing season. She's one of those people that uh, walks the walk instead of just talking it, uh, it sounds like. And so I'm very pleased that Deb uh, found time uh, in her teaching schedule to be able to join us to share information about the uh, Lakota Ray Ojibwa College. And I'd like to please welcome Deb Anderson. Uh, miigwech. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to share screen here and see if that works. Um, and uh, bring up a PowerPoint here. And then, um, Probably a little lag time there, so we'll just have to be patient. Yeah, just give me a minute here. Uh, Nope, that's the wrong one. <laughs> um, there it is. Okay. Uh, hmm. Now we're seeing it, Deb. Are you? Okay. We just aren't seeing it in full uh, slideshow mode. There you go. We're good to go. Okay, good, good. Um, I'm sorry, right to sorry, I misspoke. It is on uh, presentation mode if you want to flip it over. And I watched someone do this earlier today. Where did they go? <laughs> um, okay, hang on. Hang on here a second. I'll do it. Um, let's see if that works. Yes. Does that work? Yes. Now we are seeing it full screen. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yep. So um, I wanted to talk about um, some of the opportunities we have at the tribal colleges in the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, we have some different pathways to train um, water resource professionals in higher education. And um, there's two tribal colleges in the state, uh, Lakuta Ojibwe College and College of Menominee Nation. So I'll share with you a little bit about them as well. Um, and I just um, am thankful that you guys uh, have uh, invited me to present today and tell you a little bit about our, our college and what we have to offer. Um, so I wanted to just, I'm gonna hit this link here and I don't know if it's gonna come up or not. Uh, it's from the Tribal College Journal of American Indian Higher Ed. Did it come up for you guys? We did not see it on our end, but I will find the uh, link and put it in the chat for us, okay? Um, all right. Uh, let me see here. Um, let me try something. Um, here we go. How about now? Yep, we see it. Yes, sorry. I uh, was jumping around there. Okay. What I wanted to show you was um, there's a map there of all the tribal colleges in the U.S. There's 37 right now. And if we want to um, zoom in on the state of Wisconsin, um, you can see, I'm zooming in now, hopefully you guys can see the zoom in. Um, this is about where Lakota Ojibwe College is located. We're near Hayward, Wisconsin. And this is about where the College of Menominee Nation is located in Kashina, Wisconsin. Um, we, our school has different outreach sites at different reservations. So we have an outreach site up here at um, Red Cliff, Bed River, St. Croix, and Lac de Femble. Um, so we cover quite a bit of territory here in the northern part of the state. And um, College of Menominee Nation, I believe, has a site in Green Bay as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back. Um, let me share this one again. So you should have a background again. Um, I'm gonna click on this American Indian Higher Education Consortium link and I'm gonna share that one as well. Um, 
and hopefully that one came up. It, it's um, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. They are, um, all the tribal colleges established in the US are part of this consortium. And um, they have been, it gives you a little bit of inf information about tribal colleges in general, that um, if you don't know much about us, this kind of gives you a little bit of information about us. And all the tribal colleges have been created and chartered by their own tribal governments. Um, a couple of them have been chartered by the federal government, but their main purpose is to provide higher education opportunities to American Indians. And through programming that's local and culturally based, holistic and supportive. Um, and uh, we're at 37 in the US right now um, of those organizations. Okay, um, let's see here. I'm gonna do now. Um, we'll go back to this slide. And so I wanted to just give a little background of the college in general here at Makutare Ojibwe College. Um, so we have a main campus here on the Lacoudere Reservation with outreach sites at the St. Croix, Lac de Flambeau, Bad River, and Red Cliff Reservations. And uh, we deliver classes at all those sites face-to-face, um, -face, uh, interactive TV via Zoom or online. Um, at our outreach sites, we may have um, adjunct instructors delivering face-to-face. -face. Um, most of them are doing courses with our full-time instructors here on our main campus via Zoom or online. And our main mission is to apply, provide Anishinaabe communities with post-secondary and continuing education um, while advancing language, culture, and history of the Ojibwe. So our college was um, chartered in 1982. All the tribal colleges at the, received land grant status in 1994. Um, we went undergone a name change recently um, from being a community college to just a college because um, in November of 2019, we, we got um, permission to pursue bachelor degree offerings. So, we have two new bachelor degrees in human services and business administration that have been fully accredited to be offered. Um, and they were started um, in May 2020 is when we got accreditation for them. Um, and we have a bunch of associate degree offerings as well. Um, water resource wise, we're in the heart of water resources here. Um, there's like 13 tribal fish hatcheries and marine components in the whole Great Lakes region. And um, basically all the reservations we serve as a college have modern fish hatcheries and numerous water resources. Um, and on the Lacoudere Reservation, about 20% of that, the reservation is covered with water resources, lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands. And we have the Chippewa Flowage here, which has about 15,300 acres of um, water. So it's a big body of water. So just, um, let's see here if I can. So are, are you guys seeing um, the slides okay so far? Yep, they're advancing okay for us. Yep. Okay, good. Um, just thought I'd double check. <laughs> I'm going quick. That's why I was wondering. <laughs> no, nope, we're good. We're um, okay. All right. So we have an Associate of Applied Science degree in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management. College of Menominee Nation has an Associate of Arts and Sciences degree in Natural Resources. Um, at our institution, we have an Intro to Water Resource course, Fisheries and Wildlife course with a lab, Hydrology with a lab, Field Methods and Natural Resources, and an Environmental Science course with a lab. Uh, College of Menominee Nation has some pretty similar curriculum. They have a forestry, fisheries, and wildlife course with a lab, an intro to water and soil resources course with a lab, an internship in natural resources, and an intro to environmental science course. Um, as part of our course curriculum, we incorporate Ojibwe culture into all of our courses. And one good way to do that sometimes is to have guest speakers or do a lot of field trips to um, tribal entities. So we offer guest speakers 
usually from Great Lakes Fish and Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, who Dylan just spoke <laughs> about that, um, the US Environmental Protection Agency, the US Forest Service. Um, we have guest speakers come in from those places. Uh, we also have field trips. Um, we go to the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility up by Red Cliff. Uh, we go to the Le Couture Tribal Hatchery, the Le Couture Conservation Department, the Le Couture Public Works. And the uh, college also has a sustainable agriculture research station where we have community gardens and field plots for research. Um, and this is one of our trips we took with the EPA on the Lake Guardian. Um, with a couple of our classes and got a tour of their research vessel, which does research on the Great Lakes. Um, this is one of our other field trips at the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility near Red Cliff. Um, this is with our fisheries and wildlife class. Um, we also do, this is uh, Sam Quagan from Glyphwick. He's a fisheries technician and he comes comes and speaks in our fisheries and wildlife class um, and shows us net mending and making. So we're mending a, a lead line here. And here's another a picture of a lead line and um, a fight net that the students are mending. Um, and then this is a, a picture of us going to, with LCO Conservation Department out doing wild rice research and sampling. And uh, the, two, the two folks in the back, that's Nick Quagan and Melissa Lewis, they're currently uh, Le Couture Conservation Department employees working on their wild rice research study. But they are also alumni of our uh, Associate of Applied Science degree in Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, and this is our current student, Stephen Smith. Um, who we, we go out with our hydrology class and do some research with La Couture Conservation Department. So this was from last fall's hydrology class that we went out and helped them. And it was a beautiful day out in the wild rice beds. <laughs> um, I wanted to quick show you our website here. And uh, again, I'll have to switch. I'm gonna bring that up and then I'll switch to that share if I can get there. Looks like it doesn't like it. Um, okay, I went there and I'm going to share it with you. Hopefully that worked. Um, so I just wanted to show you under our academic programs, our um, different associate degrees we have. And um, I wanted to click on our agriculture and natural resources management degree and just show you um, outcomes, uh, you know, forestry techs, conservation wardens, um, wildlife techs, GIS techs, fisheries techs, hydrologic techs. We, uh, students who have graduated from our program have done all those things. Many, many of those things, we have students working in those areas. Um, and our degree plan looks a little bit like this. We have it set up by semester. So what you would take every semester, but you can see some of those courses that we offer. And some of them I've already mentioned that are very water specific courses. And um, their first year consists of like a year of general biology, our intro to water resource class and some of the general education outcomes. Um, okay, so now I'm going to um, take you to screen share here again. And just, um, I'm gonna click on the College of Menominee Nation website and just show you something similar there. And I'll screen share that one with you. Okay. And, um, under their college catalog, they have their um, programs of study. And so these are their associate degrees that they offer and diplomas. And uh, you can see they have a public administration and education bachelor's degree, whereas ours are in human services and business administration. And 
we're currently trying to get accreditation for an education degree as well as at a bachelor's level. Um, but I did want to show you the natural resources degree um, just to show you how they have theirs laid out. They have a lot of their core general education courses on top and then their um, emphasis professional courses on the bottom. So most of these I read off to you already, but that's what their degree looks like. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here. Oops. Do you guys have the blue screen up now for the PowerPoint? We do. Okay. I don't know how fast my clicking is going here on the... <laughs> it's, it's working fine. There's a little lag, but it's working. Okay. All right. So I wanted to tell you, we also offer internship opportunities. And um, we've gotten a lot of... We've been fortunate to get a lot of grant funding where we've been able to support a lot of internship opportunities for our students, where we could actually pay them to go and work at um, local agencies. And uh, we have sponsored students at, um, here's some of the funding we've received for different um, internships. And we've been able to place students at Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, our La Couture Conservation Department, the Forest Service, the US Forest Service, the Wisconsin DNR, and then uh, at our outreach sites with their natural resources departments, St. Croix, Red River, Lac de Flambeau, um, at our Sustainable Ag Research Station with the US EPA, and also with the Environmental Careers Organization, just to name a few. Um, and our students really can gain some real practical experience. Um, and get to stay local usually for all the lows, which is important to some of them because it's hard for them to um, be away from family. So um, we also have been involved in research, quite a bit of water re related research in the past. Um, so this cranberry marsh nutrient and pesticide effect research um, that where we measured the discharge from the Lacoudre cranberry marsh and its impacts on its receiving lake and groundwater um, that took place over until about 2005 when we were analyzing the data and we were collecting samples between 1999 and 2001. Um, and that was my dissertation um, project as well. Um, later on, we did a invasive species education and management project on the Chippewa flowage, 2004 to 2008. And then we did aquatic invasive species sampling for tributaries coming into the Chippewa flowage. So an entry points research project that was 2006 to 2008. And um, on the Cranberry Marsh project, the main thing, main outcomes were that the Cranberry Marsh went to being an organic producer of cranberries after we did that study. Um, it's diversified also and unproductive, unproductive cranberry marsh beds were converted into wild rice beds and are now producing wild rice. So we have at our marsh, we have cranberry marsh beds and wild rice beds that are producing. And we collaborated with the Le Couture Cranberry Marsh, um, Le Couture Conservation Department and Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission in that project. And here's some of our student interns who worked on that project. And some of the LCO conservation folks who worked on that project as well. Um, and then on our Chippewa flowage invasive species education project, this is the Chippewa flowage, uh, 15,300 acres. And we surveyed all of these dots in red and in black <laughs> for all aquatic plant species. So not just the invasive species, but the native species. So we had a pretty good database from that studies. Um, and we also had um, an extension specialist through the Lacoudere Extension Department that helped with that project and was funded through that project. And we had student interns and local volunteers with that project as well. Um, and it helped with the Chippewa Flowage Joint Agency Management Plan which is an award-winning plan with the forest, U.S. Forest Service, Wisconsin DNR, um, the Lacoudre Tribe. Um, and then uh, we also put together a Chippewa Flowage Aquatic Plant Management Plan based on that study as well. 
And our entry points research project where we looked at tributaries and if invasive species were coming in through the tributaries into the Chippewa flowage. Um, we collaborated with UW-Madison, the Lacoudere Conservation Department, and then um, a bunch of entities here at the college. Um, and, uh, documented those entry points and were able to recommend targeted control and management activities. And also got baseline data of our native and invasive species in our streams. And we had an online web mapping system to support community research at the time that study was done. So here are some of our students work on that project and some of the collaborators in that project. This was a graduate student up here in the upper right from UW-Madison who worked on the project with our um, college students as well. Um, we also have been fortunate enough to provide international research experiences for our students. Um, part of a National Science Foundation, All Nations, Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation program um, that Salish Kootenai College in Montana runs that for tribal college students. And also it's um, in partnership with Heritage University. And it's for not just tribal college students, but American Indian students throughout the nation um, can apply to this program. And um, we, from 2017 to 2019, we've been able to send um, a faculty member each year as a mentor. And then over the, we usually send two students a year um, to do a 10 day research experience in Costa Rica at the Los Cruces Biological Field Station. And I went um, in 2019, and uh, these are two students that I helped mentor on these pictures. Um, one is from uh, Leech Lake Tribal College in Northern Minnesota. The other one was from um, University of Idaho. And this is just our poster presentation we did as a result of that project. And we looked at, did basically um, stream aquatic resource integrity in the biological field station and compare different habitats of abandoned pasture, primary forest and secondary forest. And so, those are just a few things we do at, at our school. <laughs> um, I'm gonna stop share. And uh, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'm grateful to, uh, for this opportunity to present to all of you. I'm just looking through the chat now, Deb, to see if there's any specific questions for you. Yeah, for Deb. What are the remote and online only options like? Will they continue to be online post COVID? Um, right now, well, we had Zoom courses before COVID. Um, large majority of our courses were already on Zoom. Um, and we already had a lot of online courses before COVID. What we did during COVID was we, um, last semester we went all on Zoom. This semester we're offering students the choice of being on Zoom or coming in person. So they're combined where some students are in front of the instructor and some are on Zoom. And uh, for lab courses, we decided this semester to allow some students to Zoom into lab if they wanted, um, but we are encouraging in-person participation for labs because it's much funner to actually do the stuff. <laughs> but um, for those students who are not comfortable coming for in-person labs, they can Zoom in and observe. And um, and at our outreach sites, we've also been offering in-person labs when we have enough students that um, need a lab um, to make a, um, a group. And then we'll offer a, a lab section in person at the outreach site if we have enough. Um, so yes, we will be continuing with Zoom. Um, much of our curriculum um, is already um, on Zoom or, or online. And we also offer in person options. Thanks again, Deb. That was great. And uh, I hope folks uh, check out the websites. And, uh, you know, one of the very unique things about both uh, the colleges is how they the teaching is through the, the cultural lens of Ojibwe and Manami uh, Nation um, lifeways. And, and I think that's such a unique opportunity for a student to participate in.
Yep. And we're open enrollment, so anybody can come here. <laughs> yeah, I, re I remember being there and seeing some uh, gals of Indian descent, uh, mm -hmm. and that would be Asian Indian, and um, in their, I think, your nursing program, if I remember. Yeah, we have quite a few Som Somali students in our nursing oh, program. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. They, 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 uh, there's quite a community in Minneapolis that um, uh, take courses in our nursing program here. Um, Great. Yeah, so so we are out there if you need us and uh, feel free to contact us if you're interested in anything. And we do have our own extension program. Most people don't realize the tribal colleges have their own extension programs and we offer a lot of little workshops um, and trainings through those programs. Um, many of them are cultural, like, you know, beading and, and um, wild racing and, um, you know, cultural activities. That, that people can learn to do and um, and join us for a workshop. And you can find those offerings on your website? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks again. I might be in touch with you, Deb. Uh, we're starting some work working with Nicaragua on, on water education. And it sounds like you uh, have some experience down in that part of the world, so. Yeah, cool. I, have, I have actually been there. We'll be in touch. On a training as well. <laughs> cool, yeah, cool. Well, uh, as we wind down here this afternoon, uh, I'm gonna bring, uh, if I, I'm gonna get share screen here myself and bring this up. We're gonna end today, let me just see. Are you seeing um, indigenous artists reflections around water? Yep. Great. What I did is I put together a little PowerPoint um, here for us to, to use as we wind down here today. And what I was, you know, I, I think it's always great to celebrate the work of artists and, and uh, singers and, and the creative side of the street. And so we always try to do that with our Lakes and Rivers Partnership um, um, meetings. And so that's uh, the PowerPoint I've put together here. I got to give a shout out to the Oneida Nation. They had a, a, a portion of their website where they had a bunch of artists from Wisconsin listed on the page to help during the COVID period for people to connect to those artists um in terms of customers and so i tried to put websites for the different artists we're going to see here in this montage um, for you to connect to and encourage you to do so but i i thought we could use the time here and it's about i think a 12 or 13 minute video but what it does is just share with you different artists and a couple clips from public tv and and another artist and i thought we could use this uh time as you know, one of the things that we do with water is we uh, reflect and we renew and we get strength from water. And during this challenge of COVID, we've lost a lot of folks to this dreadful um, uh, disease. And so uh, I encourage us all, me included, to use this time to reflect about those losses. We, we saw the emotion in Eva's voice and message this morning uh, about the loss up in Bad River. Uh, country, but really all across the state, nation, and world, we've lost folks to COVID. And then maybe the other thing we can reflect on as we go through this um, artist montage is today is Action Day with our Wisconsin Water Week, and maybe there's one action we can reflect on thinking about taking as we move forward. So that's uh, just food for thought. You can just sit back and enjoy uh, this artist discussion, but uh, the other thing I'm going to do before I start it is uh, start some water in the background music. Uh, this is a soundscape from the Danube that I'm playing just as background music. And let me go back to this. Okay. And here we go.
My grandfather was a blacksmith. My dad was a pipe fitter. And so there was always a torch in the garage. And we're heating it up to about 1,200 degrees. Anytime I have a stressful day or have a bad day, I go and weld something together, always made me feel better. I've always done this, ever since I was a little kid. My grandfather taught me how to do this, and my father, um, um, and it's, I'm going home, I'm relaxed, I'm with my family. And even though they're both dead and gone, I still feel like they're here and helping me, or I'm helping them. My mom's family moved from Green Bay, where our reservation is, to Milwaukee. And a lot of natives did because of the jobs. My mother's an Oneida, and um, my father's actually German Jew. My mom had us registered at birth. She was uh, well known on the reservation, and um, she wanted to make sure that we all knew that we were native. Where you come from, uh, I always wrote red. And at the time, it wasn't too cool to be native. You know, it was uh, kind of a rough time as a child, and uh, picked on and teased a lot, and that sort of thing about being Native American. But uh, it just made us tougher. Our symbolism, and. Um Dancing her heart out and, and showing her everybody that she's an Oneida. I'm from the Turtle Clan, the poets, the prophets, and the artists of our community. This is um, my turtle teacher. It's a self-portrait. I'm a former educator. So he's got the talking stick and a book, and this is the old way and the new way. Um, the turtle has uh, all its students, it has all the babies around him wanting to hear the story. Every piece that I make tells a story, um, and, and that's how most Native American art is done. It's not just a beautiful piece, it tells a story. see your culture in your school, if you see your culture in your curriculum, um, if you see your culture valued, you know, if you see your culture around you, it says to you, my culture is important. Mm. Um, and it says then to you, I am, I'm, I have value, I, I am of worth. In the year 2013, Anishinaabe artist and educator Wayne Vallier, Minogijik, partnered with folklorists and artists at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to build a birch bark canoe on campus. Integral to that project, called Wigwasijiman, These Canoes Carry Culture, was the involvement of students from the Envision program of Lac de Flambeau Public School, who assisted in the harvesting of the materials in and around the reservation, and who came to the UW campus to participate in the work of the canoe's construction. The following spring, the finished canoe was brought back to the reservation for a public celebration and launching. Students and staff of the school, along with parents, elders, and the wider Lac de Flambeau community, came together to mark and to celebrate an important step in the restoration of the Ojibwe canoe tradition among young people of the community.
Uh, this painting is called A Work in Progress, and it is, as you can see, a painting of the Ontario region, but written on there are uh, original place names. There's about 400 on here, and it is uh, four feet by four feet uh, in size, and it's acrylic on canvas and, and paper. So the original place names that are written on here are in Anishinaabemowin, and uh, down in this region, uh, they're written in Mohawk uh, because that's their territory. And um, there's about 400 of these original names that uh, I researched and was able to put back on the map. When map makers uh, came into this territory, they, they didn't bother to find out what the original names were that were, uh, that were given to these places by the people who lived there and they renamed a lot of places in across North America into English and French names. And so this painting is about reclaiming these territories uh, back for ourselves by using the original place names, acknowledging them, and, uh, and, and putting them over top of the English and French names, which were not the original names. And a lot of people um, were inboxing and saying how cool it was to see it done. Because I know I talk about it, but to actually have someone do it is super exciting. So I decided to drive over here and uh, hang out for a little bit and um, do this as well as some other things. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to walk through the warm-up like I always do. And then I'll put on the music and we'll actually um, dance it. I love my t-shirt, but i got to put on my... Uh... It's going to be hard for all of us to fit in here. Jim, I'll go forward and you... You kind of in the middle. <laughs> We're so that last little piece I thought I'd throw in. Um, she is actually doing native dancing on Facebook to help us all get a little exercise during this uh, COVID period. So I thought I'd throw that in for us to um, get access to. But uh, I hope um, uh, you enjoyed seeing some of those artists work. Uh, and then to end today, I thought it would be fun for us to come together and to sing the Nibby song together. And so let me just pull up our last little piece here um, and share it. This is um, 
um, a song that was put together uh, and put up on the web by Doreen Day. And Doreen is going to sing us through here. And I hope you all will join in with uh, my voice here. It's a, um, the uh, song is about two minutes and 43 seconds long and she is gonna go through the Nibby song um, um, four times, okay? And so you see the English version uh, here and here is the Ojibwa. And um, that is what we are gonna sing is the Ojibwa version. So what you might do is listen for the first 30 seconds, Doreen will take us through the um, three verses and then maybe we all join in at the 30 mark or 30 second uh, or so. If you know the words of the song, please sing along right off the bat. But here's Doreen to start us off and then we can all come in together. Me. I don't know about you, but it always makes my soul feel a little better. I thank everyone who uh, joined us today. I thank everyone out there and uh, uh, joining us uh, via Zoom for, for hanging in there with us through, the, through today. And uh, uh, hopefully next time we do something like this, we're seeing each other in person. So thank you so much, everybody, for your participation today and for um, uh, all your voices and lending, uh, helping us learn about indigenous stewardship of water. Thank you so much. Nicely, nicely done, Pat. Thanks Very for being well here, done. everyone. Well done.